Welcome to the 48th episode of the Nerdum and Other Nonsense Anime Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about spring 2018's third and fourth week of shows. As always, we include timestamps in the description of the YouTube video and podcast feed if you only want to hear about one or two specific shows, since we spoil, like, fucking everything. My name is Kat, and y'all just don't understand why Doreku is actually a better show than Legend of the Galactic Heroes? Why did you guys make me say that, you fuckers? <laughs> uh, also with me are... Become And Leo. There you What's go. What's up, everybody? That was fantastic. <laughs> I, I did not write... I wrote the beginning. He added the uh, Legend of Galactic Heroes on the end. Of yeah, I, I definitely would. added I take responsibility of for adding that would. part of I, the I joke. I mean, I, I did make you say that, like, your sacred Chihai Afaru was, like, shitty, so... That's true. And I forgot about that, but now I'm angry again. <laughs> <laughs> good God. Um, good news, everyone. We have a new five-star iTunes review. Yes, we do. Cat, you know what to do. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, this is by Canadian Destroyer. <laughs> Each time I listen to this cast and their hosts, it helps me put more perspective into the seasonal anime I watch. It's enjoyable to listen to all their different views and the banter among them. Is Becom the best nerddom host? Well, I think it goes without saying. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going you by bitches. Canadian Destroyer now, Becom. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> you you bitches don't Canada. give Leo it's and I any love. <laughs> uh, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Leo and I are sitting out here in the cold, like just waiting, waiting for some love <laughs> that never comes. And B comes over there in the spotlight, getting getting pet, like the prize pony. <laughs> the prize pony. I still understand how much work we do on this podcast and how much we have to rein B com in. You would. This is true. <laughs> this podcast would be eight hours long every single. God, episode. I love all of these horse metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by the way, I think that review is from JD from the Red Leaf Retrocast. So if it was, mm-hmm. thank you, JD. And also go check out Red Leaf Retrocast. It's really fun. Also, the, the subject <laughs> title for this was This Isn't Nonsense. So that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's sweet. Um, yeah. So yes, with you, that said, should we jump in? If you would like your um, review to be read on the podcast, hmm. just please leave us one on iTunes. So. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. All so, right. Leo, I got take this. it away. All right. Mondays. <clears throat> Mondays with Maho Shoujo Ore. Episode three, a Magical Girl, another Try Not to Fall Asleep. So, <laughs> yeah. so Sakio transforms by yelling Saki's name and admits she is sexually interested in her, which was a kind of funny joke uh they yeah. did do the flashback to when sakio first started to fall for her and it was like when saki praised her brother singing so she started singing herself uh mm-hmm. the gist of the rest of this flashback is the two get lost in the woods and are saved by mohiro eventually and be calm that's how you condense 10 minutes of a show into a podcast into I a paragraph. honestly think that Blah. that 10 minutes that's all it really deserves to that's, be said about it, it it's, <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty dumb like flashback honestly like i I was sitting here like do we have to get this serious like i don't care that much well there's also more of that awful singing so (laughs) yeah i have like a couple notes on this whole i'll I'll just go into those because like then you can say the second half but like in the flashback mohiro is like singing this song that goes i don't really like carrots but i like them better than cellophane tape (laughs) and like cat was saying i think this dude legitimately just has like maybe two brain cells he has no brain i'm telling you there are like squirrel nuts in his head case. <laughs> Just banging around. Where his brain should be. That's why those squirrel men like him so much. They're like, oh shit, this dude is full of nuts. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Maybe. I mean, this episode, they do question why are they so interested in him, but mm-hmm. that's as far as I right. go on to it. But well, anyways. they're dumb too. Like, they're singing this, like, we all become cute bunnies song. And, uh. like, I just wanted to pick up a shovel and just go murder <laughs> these stupid girls. Like, I was so upset. Like, oh, uh, like, I'm sure that's the joke that, like, it's really cloying sounding and, like, terrible singing. But at a certain point, I just wanted to turn off the episode because I was like, please 
get back to the good stuff. But anyway, you so can continue. So they do. They go back to the present, and Sakio finishes off the tentacle squirrel. Uh, that's when the manager shows up, and then he expresses his love for magical girls and is glad to be the manager of the magical girls. And he's like, we're going to make a huge debut, and I'll put you on YouTube. And the very <laughs> next day, the debut gets announced on the television. So... And then there's just a yeah. very mm-hmm. short last scene with some guy named Fujimoto getting pissed at the girls for saving the town. And episode four goes way more into what he's there for. But is there any jokes you guys like really like this episode or stood out to you or anything? You know, um, this, this episode is a little hmm. bit of a flop. Like I didn't enjoy it as much as the first two and I didn't enjoy it as much as the fourth one. Like, uh. It's just kind of like because half of it is that serious like flashback scene because I think the flashback scene is at least like ten or fifteen minutes of the it's, show. It's ten. It's minutes. real long. It's mm-hmm. too long. Minutes. Yeah, there is one part of this episode that is really interesting to me, and it's the discussion of like what happens to their boobs when they transform into a guy, and they're like, <laughs> where does that extra like body mass goes? Oh. And it's just like it shows them transform. It's like, oh, it goes That's into their right. huge dong. <laughs> I, I just like that them, logic. I want them to have a scene where they like are in the bathroom together and they're comparing dongs and they're just like, oh, your dong is so big. Your dong is so big. Oh, yes. That'd be perfect. <laughs> That'd be such a perfect parody of like the breast envy scenes yes. in every fucking anime. Okay, that would be good. Yeah, but it's the funny. It's just, the scene's funny because Sakio like then goes to her brother Mohiro and grabs his hand and she's like, you have a rival or something because... <laughs> And he's yeah. just like, what? Because she thinks he has a massive penis at this point. <laughs> he's like, he said something like, I don't understand, but I accept. Or something right, like right. Yeah. Anyway. Cat, uh, you take us on. Okay. So in episode four, they start out with like the, so like the normal like sequence. And the whole time that the, the like opening is going on, all I could think of is like, why is this anime full of hot buff dudes? And yet like the red eyed demon dude is the hottest one in the show. <laughs> like I keep looking at him and being like, why? Why? Uh, I don't know. He I just w- is. I will say that uh, Gigguk did say, why is this show not called Maho Jojo? <laughs> <laughs> Maho Jojo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, also so. the opening animation is just like fucking weird. Like what is the dance that they're doing with like their hand up in the air? Like it's I don't know. It's strange. Everything about this is fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> um okay, so like they start out with the show. The evil squirrel like gang is chanting like about how they should cut the power in order to kidnap humans. And it's so fucking strange. They're like, yeah, and yeah, and yeah. And it was like getting kind of old. I love I that part because you're right. They, all they say, like the only things that comes out of their mouth is new, new, new. Yes. yes. But it gets translated into <laughs> let's plunge the city into darkness. It'll help with our human kidnapping plan. I'm it's just okay. like, okay, this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, no. And so then this weird dude with like a bag over his head comes in and he's just like, oh, like I'm here now. And he's so funny fucking weird like so fucking strange he he clobbers like all the squirrels before they cut the power and then he like looks at this newspaper that has like magical girl appears and he like crumples it angrily and he's just like no and you're like okay (laughs) (laughs) he does though he's just like no and like crumples it (laughs) and so then why did it have to be magical girls (laughs) (laughs) and so then the next day they are at some sort of television studio. And then I noticed, like, okay, their manager is actually pretty hot, too. Like, Saki and Sakio's <laughs> manager. And, you know, yeah. so, I mean, maybe maybe the red-haired, red-eyed guy is not the only hot guy in this. I don't know. It's just them. Although I get really tired of the manager sometimes. Um, okay, so then they go yeah. into the bathroom to like transform and I thought this was hilarious because like they go into parallel stalls right and then like one of them is like I'm in love with the brother and the other one's like I'm in love with you and they're like in parallel (laughs) stalls like transforming and there's like bitches in the bathroom like staring at the stalls like what the fuck's going on (laughs) and I was like yes how awkward (laughs) I love it don't mind us um, and, then, <laughs> and then as they walk out, like everyone's staring at them because they just look like they're in drag, basically. Then they go back to that flashback where she basically is confessing to her, like Sakio is confessing to Saki. 
And like all Saki can think about is like, oh, she really meant it because she's being so clingy. And, <laughs> and she's like all over Saki, like fucking all over her. Like, I don't even think if this happened in real life that that dude could walk. Right. Because like, have you had someone like come up behind you and hug you and then you try to continue to walk? It's not possible to keep walking. It is just not. Mm. It so. depends how strong your legs are, you know. No. I mean, even if the both of you are trying to keep walking, like, there's going to be some lack of coordination there. So I found that bull- <laughs> bullshit, basically. Also, there was a That'd really... cool size, yeah. 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 Also, there was a really blatant, like, JoJo-style panty shot of her in her, like, magical girl outfit at this point. Like, uh. look at all tormented. Like, you know that JoJo face that... That sometimes they'll make in, yes. in bizarre adventures, but they're like, oh, and they just look tormented. It's like that, but like with an upskirt shot. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> I cringe every time they do the freaking upskirt shot on this show. <laughs> I laugh every time. I love it. I love it so much. It's like a nervous laugh. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like cringing at the same time. I, I, think, I think Leo's a little uncomfortable with his sexuality. He's just like, no. Like, I don't know why this feels weird. <laughs> No, I just don't uh, look at a bulge in fucking girls' panties. It's just so awkward. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So then Mohiro walks up. Um, why is... Okay, and the bag dude is, like, all up on Mohi- Mohiro, like, as Mohi- like as Sakio is all over Saki. So, like, they're both yeah. looking mm-hmm. at each other with people dangling off of them. Like, weird baggage. Like, I don't know. It's, it's strange. <laughs> and I don't honestly think Mohiro has even noticed that there's, like, someone dragging off his arm. <laughs> because he has no brain. Like, he literally yeah. has no brain. And I love how they have to infer, like, all his lines. Because he's too stupid to actually talk. So, like, he just looks at yeah. her like a Labrador retriever. And she just, like, thinks in her head what she wants him to say. Because that's all right. she can expect from him. Because he's just like, he, she might as well just take a picture of him and take it to like one of those professional poster board makers and just make like a cutout of him with like a dick. <laughs> like, and that that should be what <laughs> she that's what that, that's what she should marry. Because like that's really what she wants, right? Because he'll never right. talk to her. I don't know. <laughs> it's strange. Um, I can't believe you read into this show this much so far. <laughs> <laughs> I think about this a lot. I don't know. Um, and so at this point, it's almost like they go from, oh, we're about to do this performance to like, we just did the performance, which kind of irritated me because I wanted to <laughs> see like them in drag doing their song. <laughs> but I also was like, well, it might have been terrible. So maybe it's good that we didn't have to see. Yeah, I don't every know. <laughs> singing so far has been just pretty awful to sit yeah, through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they meet the bad guy in the break room, and he's a cyborg. Oh my god! And um, he goes into this like weird monologue about his tragic tragic past that they don't actually tell you because they just have him saying like blah 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 basically. <laughs> um, and then he's like, "You're looking at me like I'm crazy. Don't look at me like I'm crazy." And I'm just like, "Well, you you are fucking crazy, like." <laughs> Oh my gosh. And then he complains about his low costume budget. I'm just like, okay. Um, so he's we, like, what do you want from me? I'm freaking poor. Yeah. <laughs> I got a plastic bag on my head and that's all I can afford. Uh, yeah, essentially. Yeah, pretty much. So, for what we gather from all this, is he's not a villain. He's more like just a rival hero. So, like, he's not. He's not like against them, but he's more like their rival in terms of saving people. Um, but you can mm. tell like he doesn't like them at all. He's like, I don't like magical girls and stay away from me and all this. So he reminds the- me a lot of Moomin Rider from One Piece. Oh, a not One Piece. Bit. Oh my God. One Punch Man. Yeah, One Punch Man. A little yeah. bit, kind of. Like he does have that. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it more. He does have like a sh- thing at the very end of this episode where he's like, Oh, I need to help these people. And it did remind me a little bit of Moomin Rider. <laughs> um, yeah. So the demons appear again. Um, <laughs> and I don't know. They're, they walk in and they're like, are you okay? And it's like, no one is okay. Like, what What did you think? Like, did you think everyone was going to be okay? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, and so they, they fight them. 
And like Fujimoto, who is that bag dude, like he's like, oh, I'm going to help because like I don't want to be left behind. And he's like makes like he's going to do some magical like kick or some shit. And all he does is just like kick the dude in the nuts. And, <laughs> and Saki is like, why did you even jump? All you did was kick him in the nuts. <laughs> like <laughs> um, and catch up blood goes flying everywhere. I love how the blood in this really does look like ketchup. It doesn't even look like liquidy. It just looks kind of like gel- gelatinous. Yeah, I don't know. Um, one of my favorite quotes in this episode. Every time I fight, I feel like something precious in me is dying. <laughs> I was like, okay. I okay. love it. Um, <laughs> and then they, they finally like kick all of the squirrel dudes' asses, basically. And um, then their manager is like, you did such a good job. And Saki has this moment where she's kind of doing this like, oh, shucks, pretty old me. I did all this. That's right. <laughs> like routine <laughs> while she's holding her like blood soaked staff and like polishing it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> um, it just kind of reminded me of like the Southern Belle routine, but like blood soaked. I don't know. <laughs> um Yeah. And so then she's informed that her staff is like a blood sucking stick, like, and it's just been collecting blood from all the demons she's killing. And apparently when it collects blood, the blood turns sparkly because all the blood in the staff is sparkly. So (laughs) added beauty. I don't know. Um, So after that revelation, Fujimoto gets pissed off. Because they're magical girls. And he's like, ugh. And he, like, hits this column. And the column, like, starts to fall on him. And Saki's like, oh, I need to save you. And then Fujimoto's like, well, I don't fucking care if you saved me, you bitch. (laughs) And, (laughs) and, I mean, you know, it's whatever. And Saki's like, oh, but I wanted you to like me. And then um, Sakio is... So Sakio always looks like she just has eternal bitch face because throughout this whole exchange, like her face doesn't move at all. Did you guys notice this? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I'm like, is she, is she really feeling anything, or is she just like sit? I, I don't know. It's interesting. I'm usually just so out of tune at this point. I don't pay attention to this. It needs to be like <laughs> limited am- animation. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So basically, Fujimoto was like, you look a lot like your mother at your age. So apparently Fujimoto's been around for like God knows how long. Um, then he runs off. Mohi- and then, of course, everyone in the studio is like, you saved us. And there's like a media shitstorm. Mohiro comes over and is like, I'm even more in love with you. And they're like staring at each other in the eyes while like everyone takes pictures of them. And then all of the camera people are asking Mohiro questions. But, like, once again, Mohiro can't talk for some reason because he's apparently a dog in human form. And so there's this, like, exchange where all of the cameramen are like, what? You say you knew her from before. And he would, like, nod. And then he'd be like, what? She saved you again. And, like, he'd nod. And I just could, all I could think of was, like, that scene in Lassie where it's like, what? Timmy's down the well. What's that boy? Because <laughs> he, he just is so much like a dog. I don't know. That's um, awesome. So, yeah, no. And then there's the ending song. And then there's almost like a scene after that where they go mm-hmm. more into the Fujimoto character. And he's like riding his bike in the morning. And he's like, that's what a professional hero does. And like he's saving this like old lady from a mugger. And then you find out there's like six of him or something, isn't there? There's like five or six. Yeah, he, like, there's six home. in total, including him. Yeah, he's got yeah, five he brothers. Com- yeah, no, well, they're not really brothers. I think they're all just like the same robot. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, I suppose. Yeah, and they and they all just have numbers on their head, which is weird. <laughs> kind of weird, but they yeah. are robots, so. I mean. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if we'll start to see like differences between them, or if they'll all just be pretty much the same person. Who knows. <laughs> There's uh, only one other scene I, I'm, 
Oh yeah, it's pretty funny. There's one other scene I remembered where um, Saki is like getting interviewed by a bunch of reporters that want to know about her and Mokiro's like relationship uh, oh. after like after like the big fight, and like <laughs> they just shove microphones into her face, and it's just like she's getting gang banged by microphones. Like oh, it's God. real bad. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Anyway, I just noticed that ridiculousness. But yeah, I mean the yeah, third... this continues to be pretty fun. Yeah, the third episode was kind of a down downer but the fourth episode was still pretty funny um like i said i did keep this as a like an optional pick just in case it goes downhill because unfortunately shows like this sometimes do but so far it's still fun so yeah yeah all right so let's move on to the next thing (laughs) all right so we've got golden kamui episode three kamui mosir all right, so this episode starts off with Asirpa putting a twist on her chitatap recipe and making rabbit stew with mushrooms instead. And Saichi has this great idea of adding miso to it to enhance the flavor. And he offers Asirpa some, but she takes one look at it and just like says, that's poop. <laughs> like, that's clearly poop. And he's like, I mean, it's like, I guess miso is fermented soybeans well, okay. and it looks brown. and it, yeah. So miso to me smells pretty shitty too. To be fair, yeah. Like if you just stick yeah. your nose in like a container of it, it doesn't smell good. It smells really I, I bad. Could, I can't honestly say I even know what miso tastes like. Have you ever had oh. like miso soup? No. I uh, I am well. intimately aware of what miso smells like and all of the different <laughs> colors and what they all smell like. Ugh. Right. <laughs> that, that's that's so, what happens when you've yeah. worked at a Japanese restaurant. You just start to be oh, yeah, sickened absolutely. by some of the marinades. <laughs> oh, you did? Okay, well, that that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah. <laughs> so after all that, they come across a bear's den, and Asirpa tells Saichi about how her father would crawl inside a den to kill bears because uh, he's that much of a badass, and he believed that like a bear will not attack someone who's willing to go inside their den either because they'll mix it up with like their own cubs or like they're just, they'll just respect the shit out of you. <laughs> are you just, are you just speculating or was like, did you research? That oh no, all? I didn't research that at all. I'm speculating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so Saichi's like, well, I'm like not go in and the bear's that. like, damn son. I ain't gonna <laughs> yeah, damn. All right. I'll, all right then. Yeah, it's like, I'll give you props for that. Like you, you get it. Like, that was an alpha move. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Saichi's like I'm not brave enough to do this so they keep going uh, but soon after they see this glint from binoculars and realize they're being tracked by these soldiers on skis uh, so they split up to like uh, make it more difficult them, for them to track down and uh, Asirpa is tracked down by this one soldier uh, he tries to speak to her in Japanese and she pretends she can't understand so she responds in Ainu saying the man I was with puts poop in his soup and eats it <laughs> <laughs> um, but like he quickly figures out that Asirpa does actually understand him because like she comes down from the tree and then like uh, the drawings of the tattoos fall down uh, but luckily the wolf uh, Retar comes and rescues her um when the other soldiers catch up with Saichi, he pretends he was hunting forbidden deer with Asirpa as his guide. But unfortunately, one of the soldiers recognized Saichi from a field hospital during the war. And Ogata, who was like the guy who fell off the cliff and into the river the other episode, he survived. And he like mustered all of his strength to write one word, which was <laughs> immortal. So that's how they knew like to look for immortal Sugimoto. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. so he's forced into a corner with no way out and so he's like fuck it he dives into the bear's den and screams I'm immortal and then it's just really quiet for a second and the soldiers are like well should we go in there and they're like no let's just shoot so they shoot (laughs) into the den and that's what that was their biggest mistake because CGI bear is back (laughs) he looks worse than ever (laughs) but uh he's real pissed the CGI bear he bites half of one dude's face like off and this yeah. is no, the he point hits where, it with the paw. Yeah, no, he like just peels it off like like a carrot skin or something. And like this is the point where I was like, this show is a little bit obsessed with like face injuries and like hurting people's faces. Cause this yeah, is, a little bit. There's like a couple characters that have bad facial injury injuries yeah, already. So yeah. like this is yep. like the fourth facial in, like injury that we've seen <laughs> in this show, and we're only on the third episode. Yeah. 
I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm fine the bear, with it. The bear continues on his way and like just mauls the other soldiers as well. Um, so with half of his face hanging off, like one of the last remaining soldiers like empties his bullets into the bear, killing it, and it like before he just falls to the ground dead. Um, Saichi crawls out of the den and he's holding a baby bear cub. Uh, and he's like, I need to hide this from a Sirpa because she might turn it into stew or something. Um, <laughs> but so he goes back to her, but <laughs> she sees it. He, he hides it in his like shirt and she like sees it, poke its head out. And she's like, what's that? And, uh, but she corrects him and she tells him like the Ainu like raise baby bears in their village when they capture them. They don't kill them. Uh, not immediately anyway. Um, so they head to her village, which is interesting because we get to meet her family and her villagers. So her grandmother is name is Huchi and she invites Saichi for dinner and to stay over that night. Um, Sirpa points out how like her grandmother has a huge tattoo around her mouth. Um, yeah, we learned in like a previous episode that like when you become of age as a girl in Ainu uh, culture, like you you draw a tattoo around your mouth to say that like I'm ready to get married now, basically. But Wait, also they tell also, us, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you, I think you're gonna say it. Oh yeah, yeah. This episode we learned like the more important your husband is uh, in the village, like the bigger your tattoo, which right. is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, her uh, Asirpa's grandfather died like six years ago of illness. We also learned Asirpa's mother died in childbirth. Um, so yeah, Asirpa's mm-hmm. pretty much on her own besides her grandmother because we know her father died as well. Um, so Huchi is worried about Asirpa because she doesn't know how to sew or take care of a household. So she's like, she'll never find an Ainu husband. So she asks Saichi in Ainu if he'll take Asirpa as his wife. And Asirpa just translates this as, she says you shouldn't eat poop. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of great like translation stuff going on in this episode so uh yeah there's a girl in the village named osoma uh which literally means poop and a serpent explains that the ainu give their newborns really filthy names to ward off demons <laughs> and sickness and then when they're around like six years old they're finally given a real name based on like their personality and their experience in life which is a really cool idea i actually really like that idea yeah. so a serpent's baby name was uh, Ekasio Tompui, or Grandfather's Asshole. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Which wow. is fantastic. Uh, so, yeah, Asirpa explains more about, like, how the Ainu take in baby bears. They usually raise it for one or two years before they, quote, send it back to the land of the gods in this celebratory <laughs> ceremony called Iomante. Uh, so, yeah, for this reason, Asirpa tries to stay distant and detached from the Kamui that they take in, because she knows that they're going to kill them eventually. Um... So Saichi believes this to be very pragmatic thinking and probably different from how the other Ainu feel in her tribe. And Asirpa tells him that, well, my name uh, literally means new year or future. And so she considers herself to be like an Ainu girl for a new era who has like some different ideas. Which is really uh, cool because that totally fits her. It yes. does. It does. Uh, so the episode sort of uh, moves on then uh, to a confrontation between like a 7th Regiment lieutenant named Surumi and a captain named Wada, who is yelling at Surumi for ordering his men around. Uh, Surumi apologizes at first, saying, you know, I had this part of my skull blown out in the war, and sometimes my brains fall out, so I guess I don't understand everything. So uh, Wada starts waving a finger in his head face as he's yelling at him, and then, like, Surumi just fucking straight bites through this guy's finger and spits it back out at him. And then you get, like, a better sense of who he is, because he's like, oh, yeah, losing part of my frontal lobe has done terrible things for my temper, too. Um, <laughs> yeah. And you, you can tell okay. that he's, like, he's more in control of himself than he really lets on, but he's, he's a bad dude. Um, and he really wants to continue the war, because he's upset with how the war went. It's a little bit like those guys from Violet Evergarden at the end, who yeah. want more out of the war than what they got. Uh, so yeah, and finally at the end, there's the elderly samurai guy who's named uh, Toshizo Hijikata, who's like a real historic figure. He was like a leader of the Shinsengumi in Japan, um, who was one of the prisoners who, uh, who comes to like recruit this hard-headed guy named Ushiyama, who's just like having sex with a prostitute at the time. Who literally has like a <laughs> block of metal under his forehead. Yeah, that was. Which is I like, need an explanation for that. That shit's yeah, weird. Yeah. messed up. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. It's just another one of the weird face mutilations in this anime to me. Yeah, it's true. I was like, are you supposed to be in Fooly Cooly or something? What's going on? <laughs> oh wow. 
so yeah and so Hijikata just basically says like we need you because we're eventually gonna uh, face off with the 7th regiment and try to steal their tattoo skins and so we need you on our side and that's basically how that episode ends so we're, we're at f- 5 right 5 and 3 5 face injuries 3 episodes <laughs> This is Are you going to keep a running counter? Yes. <laughs> yes. Art Leo, tell us about the face injuries in episode four. <clears throat> oh, do you want me? No, just go over episode four. <laughs> <laughs> so in episode four, uh, a Serpa shows Sugimoto a trap they use to catch fish and wants him to help her gut them. But he has to go back to the village and to get his knife to do it. He decides to take a shortcut, but is stopped by a Serpa's uncle because Sugimoto almost stumbled into like one of their like bear traps and it would have like severely fucked him up <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah her uncle also explains how the ainu don't defecate into the river or even wash their clothes because they worship a water goddess but the reason the people who were transferring the gold got killed was because they had the audacity to pay him for the gold in it and he believes the gold is cursed for that reason mm-hmm so the kids asked the Serpa to do a trick with a stick because she is the scariest apparently you wave the stick in front of a window and make scary <laughs> noises to scare the scare the kids uh she has sugimoto try it and he just flat out sucks so she takes it from him <laughs> and then she scares the kids and sugimoto like wants to redeem himself and he tries again but then like everybody's just like walking away they don't give a shit <laughs> <laughs> well don't they tell him like oh yeah we'll definitely give you another shot and then like as soon as he turns around they just like leave they're like fuck you <laughs> He, there's nobody in the room. He's just yeah. waving his stick, making stupid noises. <laughs> yes, it's good. Um, uh, Sugimoto does end up asking about the white wolf that has saved the Serpa twice, and her uncle explains the story behind it. The wolf's name is Retar, which means white, and a Serpa and her father saved him when he was a pup from a bear, and they've raised him onwards. After her father passed away, uh, one night, uh, Retar and like a Serpa were out camping, and they heard howling, and Retar just kind of left her, and it really broke a surface heart at the time yeah yeah because she she clearly is going to have like abandonment issues and that will continue with this episode yeah yeah <laughs> okay and so here we go again a surface grandmother asks to stay with a surface forever because they can tell she is finally starting to be happy again because of sugimoto and i would be kind of against them trying to make this two couple work but you yeah. gotta look at the time period and like the situations they're in and this really makes sense, really. Well, in, yeah, in some yeah, ways. Like, yeah. In this, I mean, this is like the olden days where like younger mm-hmm. girls just did get married to older dudes because like older dudes have they money had a job and they have they're, they're, they're well more established and, like, and like girls are more yeah. likely to survive childbirth if they have their kids young. And so it just makes sense to have that age gap. But yeah, no, it's, yeah. It, I mean, it, it's more understandable for the time. It just feels weird seeing it. Because you're like, it, it's uh, mostly just been played as comedy, also at this point. So I'm cool with it. But then when uh, what Sugimoto does next convinces me that uh, he feels a certain way that is not romantic about the. So Serpa. you mean so, yeah. that's because he leaves the surf behind that night? Yeah, yeah. Because he basically realizes like how much everyone in the village loves this girl, and he realizes that like I can't put I can't put this girl in danger anymore. Yeah, like I need to leave her behind. She'll be in danger. I would argue yeah. that yeah. that means that he obviously cares about her more like it doesn't necessarily mean he, did, yeah. he doesn't feel a certain way about her because like he no that's what become saying that he does actually care for her oh i thought you well were saying, yeah I'm, like, I'm saying like he cares about her in a way that he wants to protect her but not necessarily in a romantic way mm-hmm. is what mm-hmm. i would say yeah i agree <laughs> so when he leaves he ends up going into town and runs into the dude they got information from before after he beat him up <laughs> he tells him <laughs> one of his friends Horrors was badly injured by a guy with a lot of tattoos. Uh, Sugimoto goes to the establishment to investigate, but then the woman there informs the seventh division, who then shows up. And after a brief scuffle, they take him into custody. Uh, and be calm. You were all over this interrogation scene, weren't you? You yeah, thought it was Sugimoto fantastic. Sugimoto is such a badass because, like, <laughs> Surumi is like just jams this like kebab stick like through his like mouth from one side to the other, and Sugimoto uh-huh. doesn't even flinch. I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like, holy shit. And, um, yeah, no, he just another, keeps like eye contact with them. <laughs> another yeah. fucking face injury, I am going to say. <laughs> God damn it, Kat. Now I'm going to think about this constantly. It's going to piss me off. <laughs> uh, we do find out that Surumi also reveals they want to use the gold to purchase the latest weapons from an American man and take over the region. I'm kind of interested if this American man is going to make an appearance. But... Hmm. 
Aserpa then uses Retar to track down Sugimoto by using a sock he left behind. So that night, they track it down and the scent, and they find Chirashi instead, the Escape King guy. Apparently, back when they fell in the river and they had to dry off and take their clothes off, uh, they must have got socks switched around. And Aserpa's face at this <laughs> was, was fucking priceless. She's like, this is disgusting. <laughs> How oh, yeah. dare you switch socks? <laughs> yeah, that was so super disgusting. Of course, he tries to escape, but it's he's no match for Red Tar. He's, he can sniff him out anywhere. And then the final scene is like these twins from the seventh division going to the room where Sugimoto is tied up. And Kat, do you want to add some more facial injuries? Because he's got like another two or three kebabs I mean, through his cheek. Yeah, he, I don't know. Like, I'm going to count all of the kebabs as one injury because, like, I don't know if it's fair okay. to count each kebab stab as a separate one. <laughs> Wow, how generous of you, Kat. Uh, but other than that, that that's kind of makes it apparent that he's been tortured, obviously, more for information. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, you know, Sugimoto is a badass. So, like, he does this, like, cool chair flip to free himself and attacks the twins. And it just ends on them having a big scuffle. I also just remembered that Sugimoto tells the twins that, like, somebody should leave a mark on one of your faces so we can tell yep. you apart. Oh, yep. And yeah, in this so last scene, he's like, I'm going to give one of you a fucking mark. Yep. <laughs> and it's going to be <laughs> another like a- face injury. I'm telling you, this mangaka has a weird obsession. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> then, Kat, take us into uh, Yotsuhiro Biori. All right. Which is, translates to pretty boys run a restaurant. Hell yeah. yeah. With cats. For a cat, and I, well, I am honestly surprised. I'm enjoying this show. Actually. Is, aren't you? Yeah, like, it I is really well would. done. Right? It's, like, if yeah. I have to describe it, it's just so relaxing to watch this show. Like, yeah, like a hot spring, relaxing. Like you get in, and it just relaxes you, and you enjoy it. It's just flat mm-hmm. out. I, I can't explain it other than that. But go ahead. I also just really like watching shows about people who are good at what they do, like mm-hmm. doing the things that they're good at. <laughs> like it just makes me like happy. It's like oh, <laughs> like, these people who have spent a lot of time practicing this thing that they do and got really good at it uh, are gonna show me how they do it, and it's really awesome. Yeah, like I like this anime because every time I watch it, I'll start out like usually I watch this like right after I get home. And I'll start out like kind of being tensed up still from working. And then within like two or three minutes, I'm just relaxed, right? Because like the anime mm-hmm. just has this very distinctive atmosphere to it. And you just can't help but just get into the atmosphere whenever you watch right. the show. Um, so like this episode starts out, it's called Sweet Trap, Sweets Trap Collection. So it starts out, um, I think. Yeah, I think Subaki is putting some sweets into the little case. And immediately I was just like, oh, those cakelets look so good. Like, they look like (laughs) little key lime cakelet things. I know they're not. They're probably Mm. like cheesecakes or something, but they look good. So, and then while he's doing that, like, Gure Gure comes in. He's running late because he, like, went on his morning run. And then he helps this old lady like go all the way to her house which is apparently like a long way away and then she's like oh thank you so much for helping me and he she gives him like a bunch of strawberries like a lot so he's like sorry i'm late but i have all these strawberries (laughs) um (laughs) which is nice so they're all talking about like the eclairs so the while they're getting ready for the day (laughs) yeah that tsubaki is like getting ready for the day and um, Kisui is basically talking with him and saying like, oh, I love these eclairs from the shop. It's really good. And they're, and they're making like matcha cake while they talk about the eclairs. And it's just I was like, oh, I love eclairs and I love this matcha cake and I want to eat all of it. And like, oh. It was awesome. Well, I, I specifically liked the part where Gure is like, remember we had those crispy eclairs? Oh, you and like, he's like that? Yeah, you, you could say crispy like saku saku. And like the cow is like, saku? And he's like, no, saku saku. <laughs> he's like trying to get him to say it the right way. It's funny. Okay, I, I couldn't quite get that, but that's, yeah, it was cute. <laughs> um, so then they start taking orders for the day. This one guy comes in. And I guess they're almost out of this like matcha chiffon cake. So I guess mm-hmm. they have two different types of cake with 
green tea in it. They have like a matcha roll and then like a green tea chiffon cake. So the chiffon cake, yeah. they only have one left and the guy orders the last one and then there's this lady next to him who's like, oh, I wanted one too bad. And he's like, you can have it and I'll just take the matcha roll instead. And so they're like, oh, that's nice. But then you kind of notice like after everyone else has left, he's still there and you're like, oh, this guy's a little calculating. Like he, he's trying to get something out of this. They basically they agreed to participate in the supermarket event, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, okay, <laughs> so the re- okay, so they ask if it's an open kitchen, and he's like, "It was when he checked, but I could tell like he's fucking with them." And then they get there, and it's like open, yeah. and of course, like <laughs> it's giant windows all around him, so they can watch him. And he's like, "Oh no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the kitchen is closed, but there's a huge ass window, and you can yeah. see it." Yeah, and he's like, "No." because he just hates people watching it which i totally get because whenever i like i was like in the restaurant i'm like i don't need you to fucking watch me make my food go go do your job and i'll be in here doing my job so like i totally get him there Mm -hmm. (laughs) um okay so they start out with the day and they're like why are there so many people in front of our shop like surely they're not all for our shop like they must be for the shop in front of us and they have like these poker faces on and then, no, they're actually all there for them. And it's because that guy, oh, what is his name again? I'm trying to remember. Um, it's Su- Su- Na- Suno- Sunozaki. Yes, yeah, Sunozaki. Sunozaki. Yeah. He has made this, like, flyer with, like, all of their pictures on it as if they are supermodels. Like, somehow. <laughs> it's awesome. I don't know how he got all of their pictures. Whatever. Don't they ask that? They're like, when did he get these poses? <laughs> I feel like, who the fuck is spying on me? Like, no, but so that's why they're all there because they're like, ooh, these hot men. Like, I want to see them. Okay, so they, they managed to get through the first day. Um, they managed to get the space to feel like the same as usual, even though it's busy. Like, at first they have problems with it, but then they, they're able to figure it out, which was really good. Um, they sold all of their food, like, they sold out. So, like, you know yeah. they did well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and then on the second day, they have a bunch of strawberry items instead just to use up all those strawberries they got at the beginning of the episode. Um, <laughs> and they do really good then, too. Um, and then at the very end of the second day, like, they had... That that Sunozaki guy comes over and he's like, and now you're gonna get interviewed for this like local news coverage thing. Surprise! <laughs> and she's asking like all these questions and it's kind of like stressing Subaki out. And so like Guru comes over and just like shoves like a piece of moki in her mouth. And like it's good, <laughs> it's good cover, but also like lewd, <laughs> like lewd Guru. <laughs> don't, don't just shove like food into some girl's mouth um and then she starts a big piece of mochi too it was a pretty big (laughs) piece of mochi and then then she starts asking um oh then she starts asking uh sweet about like how he's related to this big corporation and you can tell like then Mm. he's freaking out and then um so then like they cover Toki for him Taka. Toki Taka I cannot say his name Toki Taka <laughs> we noticed we'll it's really Toki. hard Toki we'll just call him Toki yeah um yeah Toki comes over and is like I got you fam and like basically distracts her with other shit too which was good so they kind of have yeah. it's like a team like they kind of have their back which is good but yeah so they get through the interview um, we find out that the Su- Sunozaki guy is basically a, like a Western s- sweets like specialist, and he knows uh, Sui's brother, and that's right. how, like that's why he invited them to this. Not because he was interested in their shop, but because he's like, ooh, I'm gonna somehow get in on this. I'm gonna angle myself in. Um, and then my last thought on this episode is, why is it that in a Japanese anime, whenever there are twins? they always consider one of them older. Like, even though they're twins. So, like, they're born at the same time. Like, I don't know. Older by what? He's my senpai. Like, two seconds? One's the older one. Well, (laughs) you know, Japanese culture is really big about older sisters, older brothers, and stuff like that. So Yeah. That seems kind of ridiculous when it's twins. I I got twin cousins, but and we don't even mention who's older than the other. Right. Well, because they're they're the same age. I don't know. 
<laughs> it's a little weird. Yeah, but the one that comes out first is older. <laughs> <laughs> Look, they I've were conceived had, at the same I've time. I've had two <laughs> minutes more experience than you have in this world. Respect me. <laughs> Basically. Okay. Uh, the couple things I liked about this episode, just like Sunozaki, he's not like a villain character. He just puts them in like a really tough situation that's outside their comfort zone. And so mm-hmm. it's just cool to see how they like rise to the challenge, right? Yeah, uh, for sure. And some something that's like a repeating like thing that I like to see about Nakao or Subaki's character is that he always seems to get calmed down like once he sees how much his customers appreciate like his work, his cooking. Uh, and I think that's a really cool trait to have. Um, yeah, it is. Also, it is really cool. They get a lot of mileage out of the cat, even in this episode. Like, I'm not even talking about the next episode, but like, um, I like this. And there's like a scene where Nakao is like passing out after their first day that was so busy, and the cat is just chilling on top of a flat screen TV with Hanging its off legs sides. Like, yeah. dangling over <laughs> both sides. It's just really cool. I, I didn't but, even yeah. notice that. That's interesting. I'll have to go back. I, I noticed it too. I. One of the things I really liked was like when he distract the reporter with the cat pics. I mean, it works every single time. Come on. <laughs> yeah. 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 You uh, get in an argument with somebody, you know what you do? You start throwing out the cat pics. They immediately get distracted. They don't know what's going on anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Just be like, well, well, I'm going to counter with this picture of my pet. Like, how, how do you like that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So episode four, there it starts out with this like weird corporate like tempura zombie guy like he's just a zombie like ranting about tempura like going down the street late at night like i don't know it's a little weird and then they do like the opening scene um so they're they're all eating breakfast and they're watching a show on tv about this restaurant called shirotake and how popular it is because of their seafood seafood bowls and because it's so popular it's really hard to get out get in so like uh toki is talking about how upset he was because he tried to get in the night before and like they they didn't get in basically <laughs> and he's like so drama trauma about it like i think you had a comment <laughs> about it become he's just like oh <laughs> such, oh yeah he just says like such despair yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah no so and then then Swee is like I don't really understand and then they compare it to like if a cat didn't like you or something and then he's like I totally understand and I'm like okay yeah he understands that <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah no and then like they're getting ready for the day and um to- you can tell Toki like really wants to serve his customers like the like what they want like he always just wants to help them out and do what they want all the time which is a really good mark of a like of, of a cook basically um and also because okay so then this is the point in the in the in this episode where the first part flashes back so like the guy is going down the street and it's really late at night and like apparently they stay open really late because like I'm, I'm pretty sure it's like really late at night at that point like i was kind of yeah. surprised because like they don't serve alcohol there really so it's weird to me that they'd still be open that late, but I guess they yeah, are. It's a little strange. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's so he comes in. He he thinks he sees on their bulletin board the customer that they have tempura bowls because he's really wanting a tempura bowl, but they don't. And then he's mm-hmm. like crushed. He's like, no, all I've wanted all day is a tempura bowl. And like Toki, of course, is just in crisis because he just hates to see this guy crushed. And he's like, I have to help this dude. And like he he does this like epic hair flip. Like, uh, like you know, like the flip where he's like, I'm not fucking around. He like goes in the kitchen and like starts making tempura. He's like, I'm going to do it. So instead of giving him like a shrimp tempura bowl, they give him a chicken tempura bowl. Bowl, which at first I thought they gave him a like a karage bowl, right? And, and I was kind of like, so because they, they start talking about how like oh the secret of it is the yogurt, and I was like, but all karage marinade uses yogurt. That's like just what you do. And then I was like, mm-hmm. oh okay, I- they're they're saying it's like um it's chicken tempura, but they use yogurt like you use in karage. And I was like, okay. I thought it was interesting that they used yogurt because I hadn't heard about that before. But it does make sense because when you do marinate like chicken and stuff you want to use something with like an acidic base so it does t- help tenderize it and whatnot and mm-hmm. i had to think about it and i'm like well yogurt has lots of uh good bacteria in it and stuff like that like probiotics and all that fun stuff so like 
I could see how that would help make the chicken, uh, I think in this case, was just like juicier and still really tender. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think the yogurt would, yeah, whatever is going on there would could technically possibly work. And I guess they do use it just like you guys said. So that makes sense. I, I my, thought it was cool. I like to cook a lot. This, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. My, my question about this is like, why did they have chicken in their fridge at their shop? And I was like, maybe it's like just for their lunches, like staff lunches, because like they don't serve any chicken dishes at this place. They might and we just haven't seen them yet. I'm not really sure. Maybe. So I, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, because the only so like there's one point where they're they're talking about the chicken tempura versus the karage and i felt like the note like the translator notes were just not very good because i could tell they were talking Mm -hmm. about like the differences between karage versus chicken tempura but like it wasn't really coming across in the notes very well um but yeah basically that's what that was going on so like um Toki is able to get into that restaurant that he really wanted to go to called Shirotaka. And like the guy who runs Shirotaka is hot. Like, oh my God, he's hot. <laughs> <laughs> and then See, these and, are the things we just don't notice, Leo. <laughs> I know. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> this is my perspective. Um, and then an adorable kitten does appear at this point. So like there's this black kitten Hell that yes, they pick it does. up. Yes, and it is so cute. And it reminds me so much of my cat because it has like the same coloring and stuff and i was just like oh my gosh although sweet kind of freaked me the fuck out for a second there because like he he looks like a perv like taking pictures of like some girl or something he's like yes and yes. then he says like photogenic <laughs> he's taking the pictures in no, english he, he it's says so something good. like yes yes that's it and he's like just taking lots of pictures and i'm like what the fuck are you doing you're creeping me out <laughs> Um, but Sui is just like really obsessed with cats, and I guess. Um, and Sui is like, I'm gonna make food to celebrate the kitten, and like everyone else is like, No, don't let him make food because apparently he's terrible at making food. <laughs> <laughs> so Toki's like, Don't worry, fam. Like I got this. I'll distract him from the kitchen. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, no, the kitten is really cute, and the and then at first the older cat doesn't like him. And mm-hmm. You see the older cat like. Sort of being like, mm, I don't know. And then at the end, the older cat sort of accepts him and it's adorable. Um, he has a name. Kidako. <laughs> Kidako, yes, well, and, yes. Yeah, the, the older cat's name is Kinako. And the little cat's name is amazing, though. <laughs> oh, it's like it's called like Denzao or something? Isn't that the what the Denzo. little... Denzo. And then they're Denzo. just like, that's a badass name. <laughs> I, I, I tried yep. to look up the name Denzo to see what it means in English, but I couldn't find it. Do you guys know what it means? I don't know. I just uh, think of Denzel Washington. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I was like, maybe it means something badass, but yeah, I couldn't find it. Um, and then one last note, like, cause that's basically, okay. The end of this episode is that like the owner of Denzo comes to pick him up and it's like, thank you for finding my cat. And of course they're like, no, we kind of wanted to keep the cat, but we're glad that you got your cat back. And as like she's walking away with the cat, all I could think of is like, why is Re like always wearing traditional clothes? Like even after all the others are changed into casual clothes, he is always in traditional clothes. It's a little weird. Yeah, but I guess it's just his, his I style. I don't know. We might find more about that later. But yeah, no, I'm. I really like this anime. It's. It just makes you happy. I don't know. I had one favorite scene I just wanted to mention. So, like, Kinako the cat is, like, sitting on the couch, like, chilling, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, the little cute kitten, Denzo, is, like, in this cardboard box. It's, like, it's pretty tall cardboard box. I'd say it's, like, four times as tall as Denzo is as a little kitten. Mm -hmm. And, like, this shiver just goes through Kinako's body when he sees that Denzo is, like, able to, like, climb out of this ridiculously huge box. (laughs) And then, like, he disappears for a minute. And then he, like, jumps up on a couch. And, like, Kinako's like, holy shit! And the cat just like climbs on him and climbs like on his face, like all over his face. It's just, oh my god! I loved all of the animation of that. It was so funny. Um, I, I so really like. I also really like the way they animated the kitten. At one point, they make the cat like moe cry, and they do it really well. Like <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I didn't think they could make a cat moe cry, but they did it, and they did it well. Yes. <laughs> so my, I'm pretty uh, sure there's other examples. I had one last note on this, which is the ED. I thought they did a really interesting effect because it's all these watercolor paintings, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And there's certain transitions that happen. And it just feels like 
the watercolor painting like melts into the next one. It's a really, really cool effect that they did. I'm kind of curious to see like how they did it. I wonder if there'll ever be like a video that comes out about how they did that transition. It just maybe it's just Adobe After Effects. Maybe it's something they actually drew. I'm not really sure, but it's super cool. Mm-hmm. Anyway, all yep. right, we ready to move on? Go for it. Got Steins Gate Zero, episode three. <laughs> These episode uh, titles are ridiculous. <laughs> I just literally binged the first four episodes before we started nice. recording. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Leo's on top and of it. I haven't, and I haven't finished the first season. <laughs> yeah, so Leo's a little lost. <laughs> He's I'm trying. I'm a little lost. I know some of the characters, but whatever. I appreciate your effort, Leo. This is impressive. Uh, episode three, mm-hmm. Protocol of the Two-Sided Gospel, X-Day Protocol. Yeah, I know. It's, oh, it's before some you start, BS. Yeah. Is, was Mayuri's boobs that big in the first season? No, and that's been a huge topic of conversation. Like, they definitely gave her, like, a new cup size in this season. <laughs> like, and what's the year difference between uh, the first one uh, and this one? I think it was, like, shoot, I'm trying to remember now. I think it's been like six months or something because uh, I had a wow. note on that in the first episode. I, I thought I was it was just a assuming year. it was longer and she Maybe went through maturity year. and her boobs just grew super big. But I was like, what the f-? I, I think it's been <laughs> yeah, at least Kat, a Kat year. Maybe right. may in a year. Yeah, because yeah. I, I yeah, know he's I like in right. college now, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, geez. Okay, okay. So it just wasn't just me, somebody who didn't even finish the first season and I thought it was off. It, no. I thought something was off. Yeah. Okay. Definitely okay. weird. Yeah. So huh. the episode starts off with Mayuri planning a Christmas party with her cosplay friends. And she's like promising to make them all wear like Santa outfits that they can, they can wear. And her friends are Kaede and Fubuki. And they tell her that, you know, you should probably wear one too because your boyfriend, Rintero, would really like to see you in one. And Mayuri just explains to them, like, hey, we're just close childhood friends. And that Rintero already has somebody he likes. <laughs> so. And it makes them all go, oh, we feel yeah. so bad for you. <laughs> so AI Kurisu, who's on, you know, his phone all the time, turns out to be just as demanding and impetuous as her formal se- former self from the previous show. She keeps mm-hmm. calling Rintero in between his college classes because she checked his schedule online. Uh, and and he she calls until he picks up because she's that desperate to talk to somebody. Uh, and after classes, yeah, no, Rintero I feel walks... Like if- if someone like called me all the time like that, I'd just be like, fuck you. Like, I'm not going to answer anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think you're supposed to accept it, though, because she's an AI well, I, I and mean, she literally like, says she's this, like, I can't move. Well, he so has this like former you. relationship with her. Like, if you didn't ever, right, if you yeah. never met the AI, like, like he's kind of supposed to not really have had much of a relationship with her. Like, I don't know. But I mean, obviously, <laughs> it's a little different, but. It's a little different, yeah. Mm-hmm. So he walks around with his phone in his pocket so the camera can face outwards so like Kurusu can like see around and they go to Akihabara and there's a kind of funny throwback moment where they come up to like the radio building in Akihabara where very bad things happened to the real Kurusu in the previous show and Rintaro just covers his phone camera and walks away when he sees it. I like uh, that. See, I didn't know that at all. Yeah. Um you should finish that show. Uh, <laughs> uh. So Rintaro comes home to the lab and shows it to Kurusu, who calls it like a filthy mess. He's, she's right. Uh, and tells Rintaro that Maho's room, uh, Maho Hiajo's room, is actually almost as messy. And he should tell her to clean it up sometime. Um, and he ends the call, though, as soon as like Mayuri returns, uh, unwilling to let those two cross paths just yet. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, there's a brief scene where Suzuha seems to have, like, a flashback telling a little girl with this red Kurisu-colored hair that the first thing they need to look for is the IBM 5100 computer that was so important in the first series. This is, like, an interesting little in-between here, which you can speculate on. We get this brief scene between Ferris and Suzuha where Suzuha thanks Ferris for basically renting out the top floor of the building where the time machine is, like, cloaked. And the, also the floor beneath it. So, like, she's doing all this to, like, keep everything a secret. Um, 
Uh, there's this brief scene where Professor Leskinen encourages Maho to ask Rintaro out on Christmas Eve. He's just like shipping them together. Uh, <laughs> while he's encouraging Maho, he mostly is interested in the relationship that will develop between Rintaro and Kurosu. And Maho is worried that Rintaro might be experiencing something called displacement behavior, which is like a difficulty in finding yourself after the loss of a loved one or just sort of being torn between two choices and not knowing which one to pick. And that Mm -hmm. sounds like Okabe to a T. So, yeah. Um, Yeah. And so, yeah, Kurosu lets it slip that she was spying on Rintaro during a group date because he forgot to turn off her app. That was really so, good. So she logs everything she hears, which is awful. <laughs> I, I just want to say from her perspective, everything she does kind of makes sense. I mean, mm-hmm. you're just bored out of your mind. You need something to do. <laughs> right. Exactly. She's stuck in a computer, you know. I mean, yeah. it, it does make sense, but she's also kind of being a dick at the same time. Like, I don't know. Yes. I mean, well, it's her personality. You, yeah, you said she's be actually just being herself, so her Well, okay, her she, she always was kind of a jerk, but, like, now she's even more of a jerk, like, because she has no <laughs> choice Soon but to dairy, be one. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And so she keeps coming back to this one question, which is, why did Rintero call her Christina the first time they met? Uh, and she's really curious about that, but he won't say anything. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, Leskinen and Maho come across Rintero during this discussion, and they all chat at a cafe. And there's this funny moment where, like, Maho has her laptop open, and Kurusu like, pops up in a window on it and, like, starts whispering to her, like, this is your big chance to hit on Rintero. And, like, she slams close the laptop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so, I, like, I always get a little weirded out when, like, you know, Christina is basically like trying to egg Maho on to hit on Rintaro because, like, it's such a weird juxtaposition. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like a fangirl being in the show or something. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, it seems like Cat is in the show and she's <laughs> shipping these two people as an AI. Uh, oh, can't funny, let funny. shippers into anime. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Leskinen invites Rintero out to dinner, but he declines because he has his Christmas party. And of course, Leskinen's like, Christmas party, you say? And he like self-invites himself and Maho to the party. So they all show up and Maho gets upset that like Leskinen like did this and is explaining how they're like intruding and taking advantage of Rintero. And this is where Nai uh, Tanoji, who is Mr. Braun's daughter, if you remember her from the previous show, innocently walks up to Maho and asks her like, <laughs> what grade are you in? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> and the thing is like Maho's so nice that she can't like be mean about it. She's just like, oh no, I'm really an adult. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, Leskinen tells Rintro his lab is, like, very merry and filled with beautiful girls. <laughs> and he points to Ruka and says, that one over there is astoundingly sexy. <laughs> Which, okay, this is, like, the return of the Daga Otoko Da joke because Ruka's a dude. Yeah. But, yeah, ho- hopefully they limit these jokes so, this time I- around. I'll give them this one. It was kind of funny. The, the introduction of Maho is interesting to me because this show has so many different... Uh, types of different girls that like she's clearly the lolly now yes yeah. like it didn't have a lolly until now they're like what what is I this mean, harem missing like what do we what did we not cover <laughs> last time we covered the trap and then the show the show blatantly <laughs> called it out at one point too yeah, yeah. i think they're going to continue to call it out from what i've seen but yeah oh jesus um, Daru tricks Suzuha into coming to the party because Suzuha didn't want to come because she doesn't ever want to pa- cross paths with her, her mother when she doesn't have to. Um, she but, yeah. has a good reason. Yeah, she has a good reason. She doesn't want to create like a time paradox. Um, well, so, that, but, and also she her, her mother jumped in front of her and got cut down by a, like a drone and yeah. she ended up bathing in her blood. So I could see how it'd be weird to <laughs> meet your mother from the past because you're yeah. like, I know how you end and I didn't like it. <laughs> right. Um, good self-control by her though too because like you would think like I would want to spend every second I could with my mother if I knew that I'll never see her again uh, in the future. I think, I think there's both reactions yeah. in extreme. So yeah. yeah. But anyways, go ahead. So she arrives at the lab and she's uh, thrown off that it's like completely dark and ends up tackling her mom onto the ground before they can explain that they were just trying to surprise her and like Suzuha's like I'll leave but Rintero tells her no you should stay you should enjoy the party um, 
So mid-party, Rintero goes up to the roof to chat with Kurusu on the phone, and he tells her that he called her Christina because he couldn't say her name normally, and it was just easier for him because he liked her so much, which is kind of like an aw kind of moment. Um, he also did the teaser. And to teaser, yeah. And unfortunately, Mayuri overhears this as she comes to check on him. And Maho also goes up. There's like a bunch of girls going up the roof and sees Mayuri like running back down the stairs. And like Mayuri's like, what the hell's going on? There's the curse who's around. Like, um, so she snatches the phone away from Rintero and turns off the app, telling him it's easy to be deluded, but he needs to understand that cr- the real Kurusu is dead. Um, and at that moment, he has this weird vision of a timeline where it looks like a lot of his friends have died. Uh, yeah. So that's where they end the episode. Yeah, so, yeah. no, it's yeah, no, it's it's an interesting episode. Like, but it's it's kind of weird how he starts flipping timelines again at this point. So it's like interesting because they got back to like that feeling of like the first half of Steins Gate where everybody's just hanging out at you know the lab and like doing hijinks and stuff but they also progressed the plot uh, Mm -hmm. in important ways too so yeah (laughs) yeah for sure yeah yeah, so they the episode 4 is called Solitude of the Mournful Flow (laughs) another weird (laughs) fucking name and then they, and then they top it all off they like put a cherry on it by and then a stray sheep because like it needed <laughs> something else, obviously. Um, so he's he's in this weird timeline thing that he just went into when while he was on the roof. It's it's almost like he's like in a war or something, and he's like yeah. being. And then then yeah. he's like at a military office or something, and they're t- talking about like, oh, we're happy to have you here. And then like right. Then he he's in his room like he almost like woke up or something and I'm like wait but wasn't he on the roof and then then they're back at the Christmas party so that kind of confused me like I, I didn't know what was going on there um, but it was interesting <laughs> it was some sort of weird time they're tra- mess. they're trying to suggest that like he jumped uh, timelines again or something like that I believe. yes yes somehow yeah. and remember Rintero is like the only one who can like remember things that have happened in different world lines yeah so for sure. yeah um, uh, and there's yeah, a very no. interesting part about that though is that like Kurosu tells Rintero that he called her back right after hanging up on her on the roof oh yeah and it's like he has no memory of that and it's like interesting who mm-hmm. called her and I was like, does this mean that she can he can talk to her from different world lines somehow uh, because of the the way the Amadeus system works? Or does this just mean that, like, another version of him has time traveled back I to now? I think it has something to do with the logs specifically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because they record everything. So, yeah, okay. I think we'll come back to that. Yeah, that, I'm sure we'll come back to that at some point because, like, there's no way we're not going to see that now. Um, yeah, it's okay. clearly important. But yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he, as soon as he snaps back to the party, he immediately freaks out and he's like, "My Yuri, my Yuri!" And I, I feel like he's kind of having like a weird my Yuri like PTSD moment because he's like seen yeah. my Yuri die so much. Like after he has these weird time fluctuations, um, mm-hmm. but of course she's she's fine this time, um, <laughs> and it's all good. But it was kind of sad for a second then they flash to later in the evening uh rentaro is like waiting in a restaurant and he's got this like weird lingerie i guess it was in a present exchange that he got it yeah he got he got this strange lingerie <laughs> yeah <laughs> and like he takes it out and people are just looking at him like i don't know why you have that like <laughs> um <laughs> um yeah so then the the two like so it's um rentaro the foreign scientist and Maho and they're all like sitting at this You mean Mr. English? Yeah, Mr. English pretty much. I don't I don't know who- Jesus <laughs> Christ. He, yeah. I mean it's not okay. I've definitely heard worse. It's not the worst Me it could too. be. Yeah. But it does it does get a little grating. Um so that they're all talking about the experiment and the two of them note that she is opening up to him and they admit that they want her to fall in love with him. And I'm kind of like that's fucked up. Like, what are y'all doing? Uh, Maho talks talks about how she wants to know more about Kurisu because there was so much she never got to know about her before she died. And, like, you can tell that Maho realizes that they were more than just close, like, that Rintaro and Kurisu, like, were more than friends. But 
she also like doesn't want to know, but she already knows. Um, and it's at this point that like you start to get hints that something's going on at Rukiko's house because like she mentions in passing that like her dad has a guest coming over. And like I just knew immediately, I was like, this will not end well, right? Like, there's no way this mm-hmm. will end well. Um, so, <laughs> so then Suzaha is talking to her dad, and he asks Suzaha like, what is going on? Because like obviously, Su- she, he feels like she's up to something. Um, so then she drops this huge bombshell that like when she came like to this time. In like 1998 or something, I think. Like, um, yep, that's right. A girl came with her in the time machine that was like Mayushi's adopted daughter, and the girl was 10 years old. And this like fucking boggles my mind, and it's utterly annoying to me. Like, it came out of nowhere. You are correct. Yeah, like they would have mentioned this before. Like, it's just ridiculous that they're just now like, oh, and by the way, like. <laughs> It's a little much. Um, and you can tell by the hair color that, like, it, it has to be related to Kurosu, Kurosu in some way, right? Like, there's no way it's not, like, her or her daughter or something. Like, it's too yeah. it's too obvious, you know? It's too obvious, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, so it's either, it is either Kurosu or it's, like, Rintaro and Kurosu's daughter. Like, it's one or the other. Like, maybe um, she was also, born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline, but I think she was born with it. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, pretty much. Uh, wait, wait, wait. So, <laughs> because of the 10 year di- time difference, would that make her the same age that right? uh, Kurusu? That's also Maybe. annoying. Because, like, I feel like they oh did that God. very much on purpose. They're like, oh, she just happened to get lost in 1998. So, she just happens to be this, like, age. And I'm like, that's also bullshit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um,. But yeah, no, it, it irritated me. I felt like it was just a convenient plot device. So they, okay, so everyone agrees pretty much to help look for this girl. Like they all have meetings separately about this, and they're all looking for her. Um, and then at some point in this episode, in between everyone talking about how they should try and find this missing girl, there's like a flashback where they're talking about once again they're talking about like the the pr- computer. And then they're talking about some like thing with Y2K and how that was a like one of those moments that it could actually just, happened. Yeah. And how that was one of the moments that could have disrupted time and they have to like make it not happen or something. <laughs> and she actually diverted it yeah. at some point. Yeah. And then like then well, I guess the child's name is called Kagari and she like mm-hmm. is acting weird and then like becomes like psycho and grabs a gun and that's like the end of the flashback and i'm like okay so apparently now this child is also psycho like i don't know what to think well (laughs) i don't think she's psycho i think she just did not want the world line to change at all uh and she like suzaha was basically explaining to her like if if i put this code into this computer then in y2k won't affect it and it'll work and so like she's like no because i I think she just wants her mother like she doesn't want to lose her mother or something or doesn't want to lose something um it, it's know. just i'm just i just didn't like this whole idea like this whole part right. of the plot that they decided to do it this way maybe they'll sell it, me on it later but for now i'm just irritated um right <laughs> yeah so then then they flash back to later on once again rukiko calls rentaro and is like hey there's still this visitor at my house and like, I need you to talk to me because like something's going on. And of course, Rintaro's like, oh, there's something going on. I'm going to hang up on you right now. And I'm like, bitch, do you know how often Rukiko calls you and is like, this is important? Like if she is (laughs) insisting on something, like, come on. It also does a shot that heavily suggests that the girl in the other room is the girl they've been looking for. Yeah. And I'm just—I was kind of pissed off. I was like, "This dude is trying to tell you something, and you are not listening." And you just hung up. Um, and then at the very end of the episode, um, Morika like comes back as the investigator who's like Daru called to look for this girl because like they're all trying to find this girl in different ways. Like Daru's trying to find her. Like Maho's trying to help. 
like Kurasu, the AI, is trying to help. So like Daru calls an investigator over and ends up being Mordica. And of course, this immediately trigger triggers Rintaro and he's like flipping his shit again. And that's the end of the episode. They definitely convoluted the plot a lot this episode. And like that makes sense to me because like we have a lot of episodes to untangle what's going on, and I'm sure it will make a ton of sense later on. But yeah. Uh, so. I guess I just I'm hoping they can sell me on it because I don't want to hate this, but right now it irritated me a lot that they did that. Oh, okay. really? I yeah. was kind of okay with it. I think I was getting kind of bored, but it, I think it's uh, kind of actually kind of hooked me a little bit at this point. I oh, just want to okay. see where it goes. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, but this is what happened in the first, uh, uh, I guess, season, so to say. I got hooked, and then I dropped it about halfway through because then I just was just like, this is so much nonsense going on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. Okay, Beacom, you're really you're really excited to talk about this next show, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, what is the name of this next show? Uh, Doreiku, the animation. What is the alternate name of this next show? Uh, slave District okay, slash 23 all. Slaves and Me. <laughs> Just, 23 slaves of me is just the stupidest name it's uh, anyway so, so <laughs> i also want to say um if you go into this show and then you get mad at it because there's slavery did did you not read the title okay or so the that, synopsis? that's not why people are getting mad though that's there, there, not there's been a, there's been mad. a couple but that's not i don't think most of the majority but anyways okay <laughs> yeah i'm going to defend the shit out of this show so <laughs> So episode three, Abuse, uh, it starts off with uh, Seiya, and by saying, I won't let go of your hand again, he unknowingly enters a duel with Julia, and obviously when he lets go, he becomes her temporary slave because she is not actually a master. So the way that works, when slaves duel, they can only keep the other as a slave for a short amount of time. It's not exactly specified but if they introduce them to their master they then become the master slave permanently well no so like they are the master until that slave meets their master so like it's not that there's only a a short amount of time but no there's not a time limit it's no it said there was a time limit that's temporary when two slaves uh battle there is a time limit that the one of them has control over the other well yeah but but if they introduce them to a master then it's then okay, they go well. under the master as their slave. Okay, yeah. whatever. So Yuga, Aya, Ayaka, and Seiya are having a meeting, and Yuga found a site that has been doing, uh, been cataloging experiments to see how far they can make a slave go. Uh, this seems, I, Beacon thought it was common sense, but I thought it was kind of smarter because most anime will not do this because uh, Yuga's smart starts to shine when he qu- quickly figures out that Seiya is no longer under his control because he doesn't answer him, which is the first giveaway. But then he also figured it out by because he was looking at this site and he did some research on Seiya and saw that he had dated Julia, who he has found on this site, and who's probably controlled by uh, Rio. So he found out more than just Seiya not being under his control anymore. Yeah. Uh, but oh, so I have anyway, something to say, though, Leo, about the experiments part, because that okay. I had an issue with this. So, like, when I talk about them treating the subject of slavery in, like, a light manner sometimes, so they got into this, like, they found this website, right, where people are posting experiments they've done to test how far they can push their slaves. Yeah. I would be okay with this in the light, in, like, the general sense, if the experiments made any sense whatsoever, but the, the experiment logs pop up on the screen as they're scrolling through, and it's like... The experimenter said, I tied her arms with barbed wire and left her there for a night. Might leave a scar. I'm like, that's the whole log. It's like, so what is tying them up with barbed wire? How is that a good experiment? Because like, one of the things was they cannot do something that can like be physically to their death, but basically they're ex- seeing how close they can get to harming a slave before it like whatever at what rule point, sets in. Yeah, at what point does their yeah, self-preservation kick in? It makes total in. sense to me. Okay, yeah. so how about this next one? I pierced her tongue to see if it would hurt. Why oh, yeah. would they think that piercing their tongue would not hurt? <laughs> it's, I don't know, it's just another experiment just of, to see if they'd even do it. A lot it's of just the some experi- amateur doing it, experiments I guess. that he performs, that the main, like, evil guy performs on her, like, the, the main experiment girl, I can't remember her name right now, but, like, Julia. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. Julia. The, a lot of the stuff he does to her is just like to see if he can psychologically manipulate her. So like the whole point is to see how devoted he can make her to him. 
which yeah, I can I see mean, that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Mentally breaker and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like the last experiment is like forcing them to drink water until they vomit. Um, mm-hmm. It's just like, yeah, it's like, I don't see how this helps, but like, I don't know. It just also feels like dumb to me. Like I, but I also think that like at the end of episode four, you, f- you find out why these experiments are so dumb, but we'll get into that later. Uh, <laughs> Becom just doesn't get the psychological aspect I of this. Totally I totally get it. There's nothing that I do. don't get about this show. I get everything oh, okay. about it. I uh, also don't like Forcibly making it. somebody drink water is actually a, a torture to yeah. get information out of people. But like, so why would you do that to your slave? What's the point? To see how far they'll actually go to, to before, the brink yeah, of death. Yeah, before they'll stop. Before they stop. That's yeah. plus uh, it's just they'll gross. go to the it's brink of death bad. and then they'll stop. Like, but why would you ever need somebody to drink that much water? But what what, what is the line at the brink of death? How That's far, what they're trying to figure out. How far can you push people before their self preservation will pick, kick in and they won't obey you anymore? Basically. Okay. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, they then leave Say alone and leave to go have their own conversation someplace else because he's obviously going to be acting as a spy at this point uh we go on to meet uh shiori who works at a princess cafe and uh they they picked an interesting era that i've forgot to put in my notes but it was i had to look it up and it was kind of cool it was basically based off like a a french time period (laughs) uh and she has this like one guy customer that says he wants to be one of her servants also and just you know serve her and he's just like super obsessive but anyways after work she is confronted by a girl that says she wants to be her slave she's she sa- explains herself as she's usually an s around people but figure out she would rather be an m of somebody who is a better s than her uh they then go to a cafe and she explains to shory what an sem is and she has her use it uh and what's really neat about this scene is that shiori convinces herself that she doesn't do this for this girl this girl will be a slave to somebody else worse i Mm -hmm. like that that was kind of neat it it was it was neat like and it makes you kind of wonder like is she doing it like for real but there's also that part where she's like well you know you know she could have it worse you know so i'm going to do better for her so Mm -hmm. that was cool uh but then they immediately get embarged in by these two dudes one of them is the dude from that first episode that's pretending to be yuga's boyfriend (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't know why he's back. Uh, and, and But then she already thinks it's a good idea to duel these guys by seeing, uh, by seeing uh, which one of these guys can get to spend the most money on them. And then that's, that will be their duel. Well, that goes on for a while and they end up at one of the guys' places. And one guy ends up drugging Shiori's drink. And the other girl, like... She's not drinking, but she realizes she got drugged. And then, like, even, like, the other dude's like, dude, why the fuck did you just fucking drug her? And then, like, the girl flips out, flips the table, and fucking leaves. Uh, Then they go to, like, a park bench and whatnot. And then it's revealed that this girl was actually the guy from the thing earlier. Uh, Yeah. What's his name? Taiju? Taiju, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's just dressed up as a girl. But then, like, Shiori's not really all that pissed. Because she's like... She's like, damn, you just, she, she, cause, uh, Taiju actually won the bet. She's like, not only did you, you know, trick me into thinking you're a girl, but then you basically outgirled me. (laughs) (laughs) So as they're sitting there, then some, uh, this big buff dude named, uh, Zenichi walks up asking who the master is between the two. He immediately thinks it's Shiori because she's more of a dominant looking female character, I guess. And then he just basically picks her up by her throat and he forces her into a duel. And the duel is to just like, see who wins by punching each other. And he just repeatedly punches her until she admits he wins the duel. <laughs> oh. pretty, pretty easy way of winning <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, and it's an obvious choice by somebody with like a physical demeanor in right. this like yeah, yeah yeah this dude's gonna go beat women into his slaves well, yeah, and this it kind of makes... shows you like the diversity of ways that you can win like you can win by trickery but yeah, yeah. you could also just win because like you're physically stronger and you just pick someone up and be like yeah, bitch you just physically beat them into being your pure yeah. slave yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but tai, Taiju does manage to get away uh, because of the confusion and he does run into Julia who offers him her help because to become their ally if they become their ally uh, they get into the car with a name with a guy named Ataru Chuo he mostly goes by Chuo and they go to the park where the other two are 
Um, but on the way there, Julia and Taiju enter a duel with Julia saying that if they save Shiori, they win the duel. Uh, on their way there, they see three signals this time. And what they roll up on is the, go- the guy's uh, Zanichi fighting the dog that Julia had fed earlier that they ran to randomly in an alley. Uh, the dog ends up biting the guy in the nuts. And the dude's like, oh, shit, no, get off, get off. I give, I give. And actually loses the duel because in the earlier scene with the dog we saw that it had one of the SEMs in its mouth and right. that, that was a, that was a strange that one was a little strange why does the dog have the SEM in there but we know people are experimenting so it's not too surprising no I don't think it's that that's, surprising actually I had no that, problem that, with that all at all okay that's yeah. the end of that episode Becom you got a little bit more yeah like. so um I, so I don't like the way that when people like hear about the SCM, they're like so nonchalant about accepting like like so Shiori's like when she's talking to Taiju in the cafe and Taiju's like, well, I want to be your kind of non-believing, especially if you go back to the one with like pig guy and a girl who got raped. Like he's like, they don't really believe it. They're just end yeah, up they're going like, along oh, with this, it because this whatever. Girl thinks this but like it's obviously not true like especially okay, in this but- episode where she's like well this late this girl's obviously crazy like I'll put it in to humor her because I don't want her to get involved with some creepier person but yeah yeah exactly. okay but if I come to you and if I'm like Oh, if you lose, uh, you'll become my slave. Even if you don't believe me, isn't there like a little bit of common sense in the back of your head that's like, maybe I won't take that chance? No, I think there's the, this, what this is exploring is the greed a little bit. Like, maybe if it is true, I feel like I'm a smart person. I will actually win and you'll be my slave if it turns out. Just like some little part in the back of your brain that just plays with that idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, like, it's like a plot device at this point. Like, like you have to get them to into these duels somehow. I, I, I think one of my big things is I view this show as a social experiment. Like, I'm I'm watching a social experiment, and it really changes how I look at stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, I'm just seeing this dark side. A lot of people are looking at it like like a flat out anime and a flat out movie or a show. And you're just like really critiquing things. And you're like, man, maybe people really are this fucked up. Then, then the show makes sense. Well, and also I think it has interesting characters. Like, up to this point, there's been a lot of interesting characters introduced, but then also like Taiji was introduced this episode and he's interesting. Cause like he, he's very feminine, but he's also very dominant. Like it's, he's an interesting character. I don't know. Yeah, True. the way he was portrayed, I thought for sure he was going to turn on um, what's her name, Shiori. Like, yeah. I, like I didn't expect him to just be like actually telling the truth. Like he really just wants to be her like submissive. Like I, I thought for sure like he was like frustrated with her personality as like the princess at the cafe and was going to like like trick her into becoming his slave so he can make her do I, I whatever he wanted earlier on when i first saw this character which he had the sunglasses and a hat on and he was talking to her that when he met her outside i immediately thought it might have been him mm-hmm. yeah so like i really felt like he he really wants just to be her slave okay like he's like he's basically Beacom walking into a princess cafe, you know, <laughs> with with a heavy jacket on, sunglasses, and a cap, and just being like, "Please step on me." <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, on to episode four, titled "Plan," which is uh, it's funny because the last episode was abuse, and Beacom wrote <laughs> what Leo is doing to this podcast. And <laughs> episode four, "Plan," is what I'm doing to this podcast because this is not not a bad show. Nice. All according to Leo's plan. <clears throat> yes, it's all according to my plan. So apparently, Zenichi Z- had a previous run in with Aka where he roughed her up. And that's when she got her, like, her eye patch because he, whatever, and skipped out on the bill. And, like, the club bouncers go after him, but he beats the fuck out of one guy. He, like, he just bashes his face into, like, a sh- stone sign or something. I don't know. It was brutal. <laughs> and that's when, a, yeah, that's when the guy named. N- uh, Narima saw this and asked Zinichi if he would like to take over his gang for him. Uh, oh, which is total Zinichi bullshit. Is, you can just tell immediately. Yeah, is, oh, yeah. Narimi is up to something else. So mm-hmm. Zinichi is greedy and agrees, but Narima wants to do a test for him. That's when he gives him the SCM and says he will pay him one million yen for each slave he brings back. 
And God. that's how he ended up with the dog hanging off his nutsack. <laughs> yeah, I like that transition. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Ron so, Howard from Arrested Development. Like, and that's how he ended up with a dog hanging off his nuts. Like, yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. So then Taiju gets his payback and challenges the Nietzsche to a punch out and bashes his face in with a brick, basically. Uh, Chiori and Taiju decide to go back with them when Aya and Yuga show up. Uh, but then this is become you had a problem with I had the a challenge big between, problem with this. So yeah. I was really confused because Julia claims that she has fulfilled her promise to Taiju, which means that she won their duel. Because the duel was for Julia and Ataru to save uh, Chiori Adachi. But they, they didn't don't do that. Really they did do that. not save her. Yeah, they but did not save her. Can I finish, Taiju. please? Can I please finish? <sighs> Can I please finish? God At all. damn. Ado- Can I please finish? Adachi had already been saved by the time that they got there by the dog attacking Zenichi. And even after that, Taiju dueled Zenichi himself. So it makes no sense for Taiju to accept that jo- Julia and Ataru saved her because they did, did nothing. They just stood by and watched. At any point that Julia had power over Taiju. What do you mean? I think the show's misleading us purposely. Uh, Taijo and Aya, they they uh, they sit there and they think about going back with them, and then they go. If Taiju had been completely under uh, Julia's control and actually fulfilled the promise of that, uh, not promise, but the duel, then he would have had no choice. He would just done it regardless. They didn't show that. They they it showed Taiju and Julia making that decision themselves. So I think the show is just trying to trick us and not actually say that Julia won that. Or just basically say that that, that ended in basically a tie. Huh. The, I don't remember if there was like the sound effect of her like SCM going off or not. If there was, so. then I think she's the, like Taiju's a slave now. But I'm I mean, not Taiju positive. I mean, Taiju just remember. challenging Zanichi to a duel is just him getting revenge and it doesn't really matter. And it may be, may be interesting if Zanichi does... well. I, I guess Zanichi is technically under the dog's control. No, no, since Zanichi is under Taiju's control now, I think. I'm pretty sure. Oh. Oh, okay. So this makes sense. If Taiju is a master, he's he's a master of Shiori, so that beating a Zanichi would then make Zanichi his slave. So this may yes. prove interesting later on. Which is why I'm confused why <laughs> Taiju accepts. Julia Julia just says that thinking it, and Taiju and Taiju a, then accepts it, not though. Not A, shit. Like, yeah. Taiju, yeah, Taiju accepts it as Shiori. the truth, which I don't understand. Yeah, he just goes with it. He He's just not too familiar with the... He doesn't know everything we know yet, which I right. will get into later. So so anyway, uh, I had big but, problems with the, the logic of that part, because it didn't, didn't make sense to me, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, Shiori and Taiju decide to go back with them, and then that's when also an Aya and Yuga show up. Uh, turns out the dog Zushi belongs to Aya and has been missing for some time. Uh, they all end up parting ways. Nothing really happens. Uh, the two leave with the dog and they wonder who put the SEM in the dog's mouth. Aya, not Aya, but uh, what's his name? Yuga? Yugo. Yuga. Steps, he, yeah, he he steps out of the car to make a call. And I'm um, not darn it. Aya steps out of the car to make a call saying, hey, you know, I found her dog. I'll bring him back home. And Yuga looks like some texts and he has somebody asking him for him to pay back money. And that's just, that's the end of that for now. Uh, but then now we meet Zero, uh, who works a night shift at a Brad factory and does nothing but go to work and back home every day. It also seems he was bullied in school and basically it's just given him a really bad complex at this point. And he just doesn't want to look at anybody, trust anybody, nothing, nothing like that. Uh, one morning, on his way home, he runs into a kid who asks for his help in avenging his father. Uh, apparently, his father was part of these SEM things, and uh, he lost, and then he went crazy because he took out his SEM and whatnot. Yeah, we see but this Zero- newspaper article talking about the, his father, yeah. and there's just a yeah. quote from a businessman saying, he worked like a slave every day. And it's just like, <laughs> this show just loves throwing that word around as much as possible, uh, even for jokes. Yeah. Like, yeah. But anyway, Zero doesn't agree at first, but then he kind of at one point relates with the kid and then decides to go along with it. <laughs> uh, they go to the meeting location and Chuo shows up. They agree to a trivia game and the first to answer three answers correctly wins. But the kid jumps in real quick and he's like, I want to play also. 
that's the deal. So it looks like Zero and the kid against Chuo. Uh, they go back and forth for a bit, and at one point they reveal uh, it was actually the kid versus Zero playing the whole time. Chuo didn't have his SEM in, and Chuo, I mean, the kid had said uh, answer two questions, and uh, Zero had only answered one. Uh, and then the kid gets the third question right, and Zero immediately becomes a slave. Uh, the big reason they chose Zero was because he has no family and friends, and nobody will notice if he goes missing. And then that's when the kid, right at the end, introduces himself as Rio, the master of Julia <laughs> and Chuo. So that was really cool. Was it? Uh, well, <laughs> was it cool that a 12 year old is the big bad I, in this I, show? I will explain to it in a minute. Uh, Becom, would you like to throw in a couple things before I yes. finish this off? So the duel between Zero and the kid is again predicated on the fact that Zero doesn't fully understand what ha- what's happening. And like I just don't think this is smart writing because they keep doing this where it's like, we're just going to pull the rug out from the audience with general misdirection. And it's like masquerading as something smart. It's, it's like, more than that. I think it's effective when you do it a few times during the series, but like this show has done it like once an episode so far where it's like they didn't fully understand the duel, so they lose. And it's like, no, I would rather watch people who fully understand what's going on going at each other. And I'm sure the show will eventually get there, but the, yeah. the like the past couple episodes has been so unsatisfying for me. I think this is part of uh, of it teaching us kind of the rules of the game. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's what I think it is. Is that, is that it? Uh, another note is that the soundtrack for the show is really bad. Um, there's this one annoying track that just plays in the background, like of several <laughs> contra- like confrontational scenes. That's just like really, really like poor musicianship. Um, and then, yeah, I have to talk about the arch villain of this show being a little kid. So, like, if you expected this to go to like some intelligent commentary on slavery, get out. Because it's not going there. I this think is just going for surprises. Going to expect There's that. nothing worth actually watching here. It's just trash. I know Leo's going to try and convince you otherwise, but it's not. It's, it's just trash. It's well, some people are saying trash. that this is a show that explores the dark side of humanity. It's exploring the dumb side of humanity. If you want to watch something <laughs> that actually explores the dark side of humanity, watch Death Note or Monster or hell, even Legend of the Galactic Heroes, which are all better at doing that. Okay, well, now I've said everything. <laughs> So a, a lot of, I like obviously I love this show and there's a big mo- I think it looks like majority of the people really hate this show. Uh, unfortunately, I've run into people who are like, oh, it's just shock value. And I think I've, I'm pretty sure I've been guilty of this before. But shock value, people are using it as a negative term. Shock value is actually a uh, just it's a very neutral term. It's something that's in like every show. It's going to be in your favorite shows. Um, I have the definition right here. So what shock value is in like regular shows and movies is a common way to show people graphically how dangerous a situation is by depicting the death of a minor character or the serious injury or near death of a character. A frequently referenced example is the deaths of like red shirts in Star Trek. Uh, near misses on major characters are commonly used, such as in Star Wars or the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, this can also involve the depiction of, this is where it really gets into the show, the depiction of disturbing or horrifying events or actions to draw the attention of viewers, or to force them to consider the events depicted at a personal level. level. And then examples in war films would include a scene of a military hospital, patients with severe gory wounds, a shot of a battlefield covered in corpses or the portrayal of emotional abuse. So like, and unfortunately people are like, it's just shock value. I'm like, I gotta just dismiss your claim right now. I mean, your shock values and everything. It's in the latest movies. It's all that fun stuff. But do you guys, do you guys understand that? Do you guys get that a little bit better? Yeah. I think what people are mostly complaining about is like overuse of shock value or like right. use of shock value if, in if a ways that say, aren't smart. I think there's an yeah. overuse of shock value, then I, yes, you have an argument there. Yeah, like that's like Maho Shoujo's site, like way overused shock value yeah, in its well, first it's episode. Way overused shock value. Uh, I don't think the show necessarily like overuses shock value. I think you're right about that. Um, mm-hmm. I just think like the writing isn't as smart as it could be um, in the way that it uses its shock value. So yeah. I, I, I mean, I mean, yeah. if somebody wants to call like bullshit on like Zenichi picking up Shiro and punching her in the face, I'm like, you don't think this would happen in this scenario? You're, I yeah, I think no, that, that makes sense. It. it does, unfortunately. Yeah. Like, yeah, when so you have a guy I, like that. But 
So anyways, I have what I call a loser scenario theory. What this show does is you are constantly in the loser's shows. If you go to every duel, I, I can't, except for the dog and Zanichi, I can't <laughs> put myself in the loser's sho- shoes in that one. But like, if you go like an earlier, earlier one with like... Uh, it's like one of the one of the very first closer first ones with like uh, uh, Ayaka and A and Yuga and uh, Seiya. Uh, the most dialogue comes from my Ayaka in that episode, putting you more in her perspective than everybody else's, and she has the most to lose from that scenario by basically losing Seiya and then becoming a slave. That's more than the other people. Uh, if you want to go to the pig guy, and what was that chick's name? It was like Lucy? Lucy, yeah, yeah. Uh, that whole scene, you only have as much information as the pig guy. You were not aware at the time that she had been there playing all day. You don't know what her end game is, what's going on. You have a little bit more information on SCM. That's it. But then again, you're more in his shoes than her shoes. You, you're sure she has a plan, but you don't know what it is. I uh, love being in this rapist's shoes. It's so comfy. No, you're in the loser's shoes. I think yeah, people he's subconsciously. The <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're in the loser's shoes. People do not like to be in that perspective. So I think, oh. in a subconscious level, people hate it. So, and in the best, the best scenario is the very latest one with a zero and a Ryu because yeah. zero hat. You are completely in zero shoes. He has absolutely no idea about this game. And even at the very end, you there's not a single thing that gives away that Ryu was playing against him the whole time so you were in his sh- the zero shoes the entire time i think that's also part of it yeah you it just, makes you feel like uncomfortable and like you're taking advantage of as a viewer like they yes, are in the yes. show yeah i think that is part of it more on a subconscious level and people don't really realize that mm-hmm. but that's just my theory it's a theory <laughs> that's an interesting theory i, I agree <clears throat> yeah all right, and on to the next show, which is Hisone Tomasotan. So with episode three, we have Please Take Responsibility. Uh, in this episode, Hisone is introduced introduced to this douchebag squad of pilots she's gonna train with. And <laughs> pretty much. They're real douchebags. Um, one's a uh, douchebag. One of them especially though, Zaito. He's the guy who's like, if she <laughs> you're not even on my radar, Hisone, you're not even a blip. He's just and being his, a real his asshole. radar, meaning his apparently like sentient penis. Because like doesn't he like <laughs> yeah, doesn't he refer to yes. his radar and then just like points to his like dick kind of? Oh, I didn't even see that, but it probably <laughs> oh, I would that. do that. Uh, and she kind of calls him out on it, right? She's like, you know, this might seem like hazing to you, but it's really sexual harassment in my book. Yeah. And the pilots are like, well, your predecessor, whose call sign was Forrest, uh, who was also named Lieutenant Moriyama, she would have just let it roll off her back because she's basically a man on the inside. And, you know, that's not a great argument. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. afterwards... They go do flight drills together, um, and Hasone is like really struggling, and she almost crashes into the other planes because she can't control it. Um, and they yell at her to pick like a call sign because they can barely communicate with her because she doesn't have a call sign yet or a tack name as they call it. Um, and they're really impatient because they're trying to get ready for this air show that's coming up. Uh, so they get back to the hangar, and Hasone is like wondering aloud about like Moriyama, and she says her tack name Forest out loud, and Masatan reacts, looking all over the place, like what is that? What is that? And like looking for her or something, uh, but nobody seems to know anything about her when Hasone asks, so it's kind of mysterious. But they don't, on it's the more day, like they refuse oh. to even say anything about her. Yeah, yeah it's that it's, too. It's, it's a like there's awkward. some weird cloud. Yeah, you can tell yeah. there's something going on. Also. I will say Masutan is cute when like he does his ear thing when they yeah. say forest. <laughs> it is, He's it very is cute. cute. I like the noises he makes. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's really cool. <laughs> as, you, as you can tell, I love noises. Even dragon noises now we've established. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> On the day of the air show, now is like really proud. She built this like automatronic pilot doll that like is waving at attendees and stuff. And yeah, we see this like mother and her young boy come up and look at it. And the mother like hears Masotan wailing in a hangar. And she says to herself, Oh, he must be on edge. So it's like you can put two and two together. She's clearly like Lieutenant Moriyama coming mm-hmm. back to the base. Um, but they run into a crisis when the F-15 that was supposed to be like the the end of the show at the air show gets diagnosed with engine problems, which emerged from that flight drill they did where the F-15 got caught in the slipstream of Masotan and took a lot of internal damage because of the heat. 
uh, and its pilot, whose name is Onaga, is really upset because his family came all the way from Kyushu to see him fly. And his Sone's commanders tell her, you need to take responsibility for this. Um, <laughs> so they go to the hangar, but Masaton won't come out of the cooling tank. Mm-hmm. Uh, but luckily, uh, Lieutenant Mariyama shows up to save the day. And she calls Masotan by the name Oscar, and he like instantly comes out of the water and like nuzzles his head against her. It's very cute. Um, but it kind of like annoys Hisone how like close like Moriyama is with uh, Masotan, and also how she's just like laughing about all of this because she's like, you know, you kind of left me in the lurch here with like I'm, I'm your like, successor, but you gave me like no like notes or anything about how to do this whole dragon pilot thing. So she kind of starts yelling and yells at her, yells at Masaton, and then Masaton just eats her again because I think <laughs> you can tell how much she cares. Uh, and so like they are leaving the hangar and Hisone is like, Moriyama, you need to give me a tack name by the time I've landed. And she's like, okay. Uh, and then before Masaton exits the hangar, they pull the top half off of that doll that now created uh, to make it like a dummy so people won't get suspicious in the crowd but, outside. But doesn't it almost immediately, like, when she does the first flip, like, rip apart into, like, pieces or something? Yeah, basically. <laughs> so I don't know how much <laughs> It, like, else. breaks almost immediately. Yeah. But I guess it, when it's on the ground, it did its job. But yeah. I guess, but I, I imagine uh, when they land it, people would be like, oh, God, what happened? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, they skipped that part, so you don't have yeah. to worry about it. <laughs> Uh, so Masatan gets like stage fright though right before he takes off and he's like starts clenching his stomach and like his Sony inside of him but she starts like punching the walls of his stomach and like telling him like you need to take responsibility too because you, you're the one who like accepted me and put me in this crappy situation and so he does and they put on this like really stunning air show where yeah they break the doll and stuff and like yeah. all the airplane otaku are like oh my god I've never seen that before this is incredible. I, I really did like the speech she gives I thought it was probably the best part of this entire episode like it was kind of yeah. cute and it was good it was a good time i like the moments where she stands up for herself yeah. for sure yeah uh so moriyama and kakiyasu uh, are looking on and moriyama claims like i lied about leaving for my pregnancy um uh, that's not exactly why i left the service like in reality oscar or masatan just stopped accepting me as a d pilot and Kakiyasu and Remy, like, or Remy Mori, uh, what's her name? Oh, Remy is Kakiyasu, sorry. They have some history, Moriyama and her, because, like, clearly they were going after the same guy. And, some secret uh, drama like, history. Dunna. Yeah. <laughs> and Moriyama is clearly the one who, like, won out and had a baby with him. Well, but doesn't she, the other one say, like, I let you have him or something? Yes. <laughs> That's kind of cool. <laughs> and then she got funny. fat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let that be a lesson uh, to you girls. After you have that when you baby, get pregnant. it's all downhill. <laughs> Watch out. Jeez. <laughs> so at the very end, uh, when Hisone comes back, they give her a tack name, or Moriyama does, and it's called, it's just Hisone. It's just like her name. Uh, and people were trying to like decipher what that might mean. I've seen on like Reddit and elsewhere, and they're like, it might mean like secret sound or something, but hmm. nobody's really sure. So I hope they explain that in a later episode. Okay. So, Leo, you, did you have anything to say about it, well, this episode? It just opens straight up with sexual harassment, which I was mm-hmm. like, what the fuck? Is this? The show's like, it just keeps putting it in there, and I don't know if they're going anywhere with it. it uh, yeah, it pretends yeah. to not be an etchy show. It pretends to be like all cutesy, but it kind of is an etchy show because it has constant yeah, it, etchy themes. It become, yeah, I know you disagree, but yeah. if they do explore this, then yeah, you're totally it's you're totally fine. You are correct then, but like at the moment I don't see them solving this. They're just like Kat kind of said they're just trying to put this little etchy stuff in there cuz it, it I mean etchy sells. So <laughs> Yeah, pretty yeah, much. I don't think it's like full blown etchy, but it is like moments that are like, uh, they 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 belong in like an etchy show, but like not like, necessarily in a show. It's like a teaser, show. like a tickler at the end, right? Kinda like, la, yeah. la, 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 keep you interested. Like, well, obviously, oh not God. me. It continues into the next episode too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, like episode four, that comes back, but like so, episode four is all about introducing these three additional OTF pilots who. They're all coming to the base in Gifu to joint train with um, Hisone. Uh, and there's like a funny scene at the beginning of this episode where Hisone and Nao are just like in the bathroom. He's like, Hisone is trying to get like tips for communicating with these girls from like a Japanese like Cosmo mag. <laughs> and Nao is just talking to herself in the mirror about how her tack name would be Sexy Jaguar if she had a choice. <laughs> I 
Jaguars like didn't that. Didn't she say it in like a very dramatic voice too? Like sexy Jaguars. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> I love what Now's voice actor. She's so good. Uh, so anyway, the three new pilots. So Eri Hoshino or Penguin, that's her call sign, is just like a really serious professional pilot. And her OTF is like in the shape of an F-2 fighter jet. And it never even changes out of that shape, which is really interesting. Um because it's just like super disciplined and scared of her, I guess. And well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, clearly terrified of her. It's clearly not a good relationship between the two yeah. of them. Uh, the second girl, Ririko Kinutsugai or Jimmy, is a very like monotone, shy pilot who is called that because people see her as a plain Jimmy Jane. She says. Uh, and her OTF is like an AWACS radar surveillance plane. And the funny thing about her, she says she has scopophobia, which is a fear of not being or of being seen or stared at by other people. So she doesn't want anybody to look at her, which is not great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then finally, Mayumi Hitomi or Morris is kind of like a cutesy girl. Uh, who is similar in build to her big ass dragon, whose name is Futumomo, which means thighs. And this is because, like, she loves rubbing Futumomo's thighs, which are his charm points, Sheep says. And, this is uh, uh, strictly for the thick thigh lovers out there. Oh, yeah. It's the thick <laughs> dragon. And, oh, yeah, and it's the like pilot a transport too. plane. <laughs> She's the one who does, like, all the, the ass dancing moves in the, in the ending. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> got the junk in the trunk mm. <clears throat> so the new pilots all go out together for drinks and penguin there explains that like her tack name comes from like the idea of being the first penguin li- willing to leave the colony and dive into the sea because she wants to be japan's like first female fighter pilot um because i guess like otf pilots don't really count uh so that's why she wants to treat the otfs as fighter planes rather than dragons because she wants to believe that she's like on the same level as all of these fighter pilots um but like morris uh who pilots futumomo is like really upset about this because like she says like you know i'm kind of lazy but like no my dragon is like a super hard worker and, like she gets angry about it and then this is where like more of that sexism comes in like so outside the bar like penguins leaving and zaito zaito is showing up and he's like trying to trying to hit on her and she leaves like immediately and he's just like well you know the way to cultivate prideful chicks like her is to completely break their spirit <laughs> yeah. So, yeah some shit <laughs> And so his plan to do that comes the next day when they have like a mock battle exercise where uh, Penguin and Hisone are supposed to escort the other girls' planes uh, and Zaito is one of the attackers. And so like immediately at the beginning of the fight, like Penguin breaks off from formation to face off against them. And Zaito is like, oh, I have an opportunity to break her pride. Then I can have open (laughs) season on her heart. Uh, So yeah, he's he's a douche. Um, But... (laughs) Penguin pushes her F2 way too far uh, during this dogfight, and his like tail pops out, and then he eventually just like completely like lets go of his like hidden nature and just has to land as like a dragon. He's completely exhausted from trying to like what contain himself. What do they call himself. those modes? Foxtrot uh, and hotel. Yeah, hotel mode. I think yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is hotel the dragon mode? I can't remember. I'll it's have to one pay or attention. the other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Penguin throws like a tantrum because she's really upset and she doesn't want to be like a caretaker for an animal. She just wants to be a pilot. And then Morris is like in the locker room listening to this and she like crushes a hairspray bottle in her hands and like tells her like dragons aren't things, Penguin. And she like leaves in tears. Um, And then Hisone is like way too open as usual and tells um, Penguin that like if you think your F2 is junk, that must mean you're junk as well. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And then, yeah, after that, at the very end of the episode, this new character is introduced named the Administrative Vice Minister Iboshi. Um, And, like, yeah, it just seems that he's interested in the unique relationship between OTFs and their pilots and finding out more about it. But he also seems kind of evil. So we'll see how that plays (laughs) out. I love that. Like, in your little voice, evil. Evil. (laughs) Um, I just like that they introduced three new uh, girls. I think it added a lot of new dynamics to the yes. show, and I kind of needed it. That's what I, I so. specifically liked about the episode was these new characters and how different they all are from each other. So I think it's going to mm-hmm. help this show a whole bunch. 
It might. I it might. I do like Morris, although sometimes when she does the thigh thing, she kind of irritates me. Although I like her <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. She's a little moe. Yeah. I agree. And, yeah. and then Jimmy sometimes just creeps me out a little bit. But like, I might learn mm-hmm. to like her. We'll see. <laughs> uh, just in general, I thought like the fighter jet animation was awesome. These couple episodes too. Just it, thought it was I'd throw pretty that good out there. It was pretty good. Yeah. You're right. I'm All right, try, should we move on to the to, next thing? As a side note, I'm trying real hard not to hate this. I know you guys really like it. <laughs> like it's it's not my thing, but but I'm hanging yeah. in here. <laughs> I, I just think it's okay. I don't I don't think it's anything fantastic. Yeah, you know it's what not cats that thing I, is punching people in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. All right. Okay, so we got Megalobox. We have episode three. Gear is dead. Uh, <laughs> so Nambu has successfully registered Joe at the Megalobox HQ, and it ranks him at 257th place. It's the very rock bottom. Uh, they also know that Yuri's gear is top of the line, and they need to do something about Joe's like just very outdated, just junk-ass gear. So they visit a guy who specializes in the gear. And while there, Nambu sees like some gear in the back that was like, it turns out to be a prototype for what gear Yuri uses now. Uh, some random kids come in with like some cameras they'd swindled in an earlier scene. And the <laughs> shopkeep gives them like something called red candy. It, it, it's, it yeah, act, they look high. It's got to be drug. It's got to be drugs. The way they react, I'm just like, <laughs> good God. I didn't think about it while watching, but I think you're totally right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't like, they, they like, pop them in their mouth. kind of? Like, when yeah, they're they eating pop them, them in their yeah. mouth, and then they just, like, lean back in the couch. It's like they just, like, took a fucking they big just go syringe of heroin. <laughs> I'm so innocent that I was like, oh, that candy must taste really good. <laughs> no. That's, that was my Poor reaction. Well, and, then, and then Sachio's reaction, yeah. <laughs> Sachio's reaction, like, he's super pissed because he didn't give him enough candy for him to have one, too. So, right. like, that's just like a drug addict's reaction. I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's It's messed up. Uh, but Tachio takes an interest in them and he tracks them back to their place and watches them for a couple days as they like train and stuff. He's kind of wowed by uh, Joe who like kind of defended them a little bit from like the the uh, j- bouncer, the guy that was there. He's, mm-hmm. he used, I guess he used to be big back in his day. He said he was like rank like 98 or something. I think I his name's know. like Potemkin or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the battleship. <laughs> uh, they... They finally get some new gear and like the kid steps in saying it's not going to work. He seems to really know his stuff. The show just sells sells you on it right here. Uh, He also wants to go to Megalonia with them, but they refuse. It seems his motives have something to do with a picture in his hat of like his parents. That's as far as I've gone with that so far. Very curious to find out about yeah. that. Like if his dad was a boxer or something. I don't know. <laughs> it didn't look like it in the picture. I don't believe. <laughs> yeah, well, but he, he knows so much about boxing. He so obviously something there. really wants to go to Megalo Box Tournament for some reason, right? So I think there must be someone he wants to meet there. Because why Could else be. would he yeah. care so much? Yeah, yeah. And, and the only lead they give you is that picture of his parents. So, mm-hmm. right. Um, so what he does is he goes and steals that prototype from the shop to give it to him but he ends up getting caught but he managed to get the gear to his friends and they give it to joe but they say joe has to go help his friend so of course joe arrives in style and by style i mean driving his motorcycle through a fucking window (laughs) (laughs) that was awesome he ends up fighting out with the bodyguard and he uses like the new gear Uh, it turns out the bodyguard was like 96 or something uh he's like getting in some really good punches but the gear eventually falls apart from blocking the other guy's punches. Apparently his gear, he didn't have like gloves on him. So he's just like hitting the metal on that. Yeah. Well, I uh, mean, if it falls apart that easily though, like, I don't know if they really wanted to use it, even if it's supposed it, it to be a state prototype. of the art yeah, it's or a piece whatever. of junk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. Uh, but then Joe does go back at him without the gear and the way they, they stop him, he has to get him with a counter, which, Sachio can hear the difference in the guy's right and left motors and calls out that he's going to throw a left so Joe gets the counter and takes the guy out uh, that's when the three then decide to go to Megalonia together uh, also did you guys notice this soundtrack I mean it's pretty fucking yes. lit it's impossible not to <laughs> yeah. notice it's so fucking good yes Yeah. Um, 
I also yeah they they've started this like um, theme of like man versus machine on this episode where like they show Ooh. Yuri who's fighting uh, like a, like training against like a fucking robot just like Ivan Drago in Rocky Four like kind of thing uh, and Junk Dog is like clearly like the Rocky Balboa of this show uh, who's like you know more natural training so yeah I thought that was really interesting and that definitely plays into the next episode too but yeah. Uh, we can yeah, go on okay. to the next one All if Cat right. uh, wants to do I'll that. T- I'll take over from here. <laughs> okay. okay. You so, take it, Cat. Yeah, no. So then they, they're kind of freaking out because they don't have any gears anymore. Because they, they started out, they lost the prototype that, you know, they did all that work to get basically in the last episode well the and prototype then, and they still had some other gear well, which yeah. I, I left that part out where it he act where uh nambu actually accidentally fried it didn't it wasn't it like so. on fire or something and he like takes it yeah, out yeah. of the <laughs> ship and is like fuck and then junk dog comes back and is like what are you doing and he's like don't yell yeah, he was at me doing now. some work like, on it yeah he yeah. was doing some work on it and he fucked it up and it, it caught fire <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, well, I can't do anything about it now. <laughs> like, so um, you kind of go into this match thinking, like, what are they going to do? Because they don't have any gear. And it com- becomes pretty clear right away that they're trying this new gimmick where they're going to have him fight without gears because they don't have any for him. And it's also kind of a way for them to get more people to fight him, um, mm-hmm. which I guess is good. And they call him Gearless Joe. And then, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I like the okay. I like the opening where they they like introduce him like Gearless Joe, and then they go into the opening like song. It's like kind of badass. Yeah. Um, kind of hypes it up for you. By the way, that Gearless that, Joe thing is probably a reference to Shoeless Joe Jackson, who's a famous baseball player from the Chicago White Sox in like the early 1900s. Really? I just thought of that, but like it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> okay. Well, anything that involves the soundtrack is going to be awesome on this cat. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. So anyway, so then they come back. Speaking of, can I, when can I buy the soundtrack? Probably I don't in a couple know. months. That, that oh, one God. rap song in like the second episode, I need it. So whenever it comes out, yeah. I'm going to have to at least get that. Um, okay, so they come back and the referee is trying to decide whether it's legal for him to fight without a gear. And I get that they're trying to use it as a gimmick to entice people to fight him. But it really seems like the show just wants to be all, look how much of an old-fashioned show we are. Like, technology is for whims. We can beat technology <laughs> with our bare fists. You know what I mean? Like, it really seems yeah. to want to go for that. And it kind of disappointed me because I was hoping that it was would be more of a futuristic anime with older, like grittier tones, and it's right. it's really more leaning more heavily on like the older, old school grittiness than the like futuristic tones at this point. Um, so at first, the referee almost doesn't let him fight with the gear. Like without the gear, but then discusses it for a while, and they decide it's okay. But the logic they use to decide this doesn't make any sense to me at all. Like it's something about the game doesn't allow fights without gear, like the Megalobox game itself. But they are using standard rules, not within Megalobox regulations, uh, so it's okay. But like this is supposed to be like for a spot in the Megalobox rankings. Did I don't? Did you watch this on Crunchyroll? Mm-hmm. I, I thought the crowd was yelling at the ref, and the ref explained that there is no rule against not using gear. So then yeah, he see, could proceed. That's what I thought too. I that's don't know. what I thought too. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. The, the it's still kind of was... like a, it's obviously a stunt either way. Like yeah, it, it yeah. That's weird. Weird. like not in the spirit of the sport. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, didn't, it really didn't really make sense to me whatever rules they were using. But I was like, whatever. Clearly. Obviously, they're they're making it work for the sake of the anime. Whatever. Um, and then Joe's all like shaking, kind of, and he says he's like excited, but we all kind of know he's like fucking scared out of his mind. And then <laughs> we go into the match, and at first Joe is like doing pretty well at avoiding the punches, and he's actually getting some like some modest hits in like he's not really doing much damage but he is hitting him occasionally then Mm -hmm. joe finally gets hit by the shark dude and it's obvious like this is going to be the main issue with the strategy how could he possibly like continue to get hit over and over and not just he cannot take hits like that (laughs) yeah um when he does get hit the sound out from his perspective is pretty realistic and it's it's good imagery uh he does manage to get up the first time 
Uh, but I don't think it's really realistic that he gets up at all. Like he's barely hanging in there at halftime. You can tell he's got like a bad concussion. Like everything's all soft and cottony for him. You can tell. Um, he really <laughs> should be much worse off than he is, considering he just got hit with like a steel beam. <laughs> I don't know. Cat. Well, he did. He, the only reason I gave it like a little bit of like leeway is because he got hit in. He did block it partially, but like still, like it's pretty bad. Still, you've got you've got to ignore this. I mean, I know. I, I'm not. I'm not too angry. I'm just pointing it out when it's Suspend unrealistic. Suspend your sense of disbelief. <laughs> I do. It, I think I'm doing a pretty good job. I'm just pointing it out. Some. Yeah, just um, one weird thing about the the punching and stuff is mm-hmm. that you know. When these when two boxers go against each other with both the gear on, does everybody like get wrecked? No matter whoever just gets the first punch in, pretty much you would think. <laughs> yeah, but we don't get we haven't seen any of that yet, really. Not yet. No, I'm, they're, I'm, they're, yeah, I'm only, interested. What, only what we've seen is when uh, Joe was throwing the matches and he was just getting the shit pummeled out of him. So if anybody, he should be able to take these hits. Shark hits him once and he's almost out. Well, yeah. do, my so, question is, does weird. the gear protect you when you get hit or does it just make your so. punches stronger? I don't know. They, they have not said anything I mean, about that. It doesn't that, protect so I doubt your it. head at all. I don't think so. Well, that, that's, yeah. that's the only thing I could think of is I can I can more understand him not being knocked out immediately if the gear doesn't protect him from the punches in the first place. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, sometimes I wish it gave you some more explanation on some things, like give you some details. But the show is just too condensed; like they can't go into shit. Um, okay, so the show does some really good imagery. Once he gets into the second half of the fighting, like his feet sink into the ring. It's really good imagery. Um, it's yeah, clear, yep, yep, yeah yep. no, it was good. It's clear at this point that if he gets hit, like he's going down, like he's done. He's so shaken from his previous hit that he's not even functioning well. And he's really just slowing down. He's not even hitting him at all at this point. But on the other hand, the shark dude ends up being under a lot of pressure to hit him because the crowd is kind of like going crazy and they're pissed off that he dare go into the ring without a gear. And so he keeps getting egged on by the crowd and he ends up fouling Joe really quickly, which works in Joe's favor. And the manager gets really upset at him during the foul break. He's kind of yelling at him, uh, asking what he's doing. But, I mean, dude, I don't understand why the manager's so angry because does he not see he's fucked up? Like, the kid notices it right away, and he's only known him for, like, a tiny bit. Um, they, I think the manager's too scared of, like, what's going to happen to him if Joe loses this match to yeah, think about it. So the kid, like, knocks some sense into him, basically. I guess. Uh, also, he kind of points out – so the kid jumps in between the manager and Joe, kind of points out, like, manager, you need to chill the fuck out. Joe, you need to quit trying to do everything yourself. You need to rely on us more. And he kind of, he almost makes the mood go up. It's a really good moment. Um, yeah, the, he, yeah. Sell, he sells his speech for sure. Mm-hmm. And with the help of the kid, the two of them make up. Um, and they kind of have this moment where they're like, fear is a human emotion, emotion, but we must overcome it. You know, and it's all, all the feel good, like badass shit that she came here for. Um, and he goes back into the ring. <laughs> Um, Joe just gets the shark dude like good in the face. There's like drool everywhere. It KOs him, which also is a little unrealistic, but I can't deny that I loved every fucking second of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, at this point, they have a montage of Joe beating a bunch of different guys in a row and training. And I know the montage is a classic, but I, I don't really like it. just seems very stereotypical in some ways, even though it is a classic. Um, mm-hmm. I can't help but thinking also that the series would do better to at least show some of these fights, but I also know they're on a crunch time wise. I wish they'd made this a longer yeah. anime. Like I wish they'd just given us I the 26 too. episodes that this deserves. Yeah. They're only 12. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, they have like how much God awful amount of money to do this. Asha no Joe, like namesake, like they could probably do 26 episodes or 24 episodes or something. Um, I- in an earlier episode, or either this one or the last one, does Nam, doesn't Nambu say that only his first three fights will be without gear? Something like that. I don't. I th- yeah, I think, think so. I think so. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Nothing. I was just thinking about 
because I'm, I'm already working on like the next two so <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah there's a shot of the manager at the very end negotiating for joe's next fight and at first i kind of thought oh this is going to be another stereotype where they keep showing flash shots of the guy that's the russian guy's uh, rival he's got like dreadlocks i think um and i was mm-hmm. assuming that he would next be fighting him because i'm thinking well how are they going to get him fighting the russian guy and him fighting the 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 you know the rival before the russian guy in and get stuff sandwiched in between those two fights well th- the thing is it they were i thought that too but what it turns out is they were just actually announcing who is second in the megalo box is only like 12 people are going to actually be in it yeah that's yeah. what it was doing yeah so it was yeah it was weird it misled me too yeah but, but it, but it that, wasn't that and i was kind of surprised because i was like okay at least it's not that predictable but it's obvious the manager like knows the guy he's going to be fighting next and it's the manager's former like student and i kind of wonder yeah. how the manager will feel about that like if the manager cares about this other guy how that's going to affect it it'll be interesting oh yeah you have not seen the next two episodes have you no i mean i oh, try to stay objective so that when we do this <laughs> Okay, I exactly. Don't give Leo. things away. <laughs> I'm trying to get shit done because I don't yeah, have a little amount of time. Uh, no, I've, it's, it's I've actually basically done almost all my watches already. That's, but, uh, that's yeah, good. Yeah, uh, Kat, they, they will answer every one of those questions. So all look right. forward to it. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> it's all I you had become. one thing I wanted to say about this was, was that there was a really funny moment when he enters the ring without his gear and a heckler just yells, hey, you forgot something. <laughs> 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 Which I fucking loved. I love that sarcasm. Yeah. And yeah, the the soundtrack was amazing on his entrance theme and everything. Jesus. And just so mm-hmm. good. <sighs> um, but yeah, any anything else on that before we that's move on? That's all I got. That's all you After all become. that grittiness, we need a little fluff, a little, little romance. Ooh. To take it well, away. I got some fluff. Yeah. <laughs> so, Wotakoi, Wotako Nikoi wa Muzukashi, episode three, sales event and gamers meetup. This was by far my first episode of the series that I actually really loved. Um, so it focuses on the characters being otakus at Kamaket. Basically, um, Narumi is going there to sell her BL dojins, and like <laughs> Hirotaka is helping her, basically. Uh, and it's funny, because she's like selling them. When she does, she puts on this like really cutesy moe act for each of the customers, and Hirotaka is like fanning himself because he's getting so jealous. Oh, she's all super dressed up, too. <laughs> yeah, she's really nicely dressed and everything. Um, he, he so he goes away for a smoke and he bumps into Taro, who is barely containing his own jealousy because like Hanako is doing a crossplay, and Taro's just like looking at this crowd of people around her, just like trying not to look because he's so jealous of like well, and, all the and attention. And Hanako just looks like a like a bishi guy, right? So like, yes. yeah. so they're, they're, the two boys are over there in the corner commiserating, and Hirotaka's yeah. like that bishi boy is your girlfriend. <laughs> Like it was good. <laughs> yep. so I, th- I think Narumi, it was a good like, little bonding they those two had in that little uh, yep, scene. It definitely yeah. oh, was. Yeah. <laughs> Narumi leaves Hirotako alone to go buy Dojins, however, and she like overhears girls talking about this hot guy who's selling yaoi porn. And so she like <laughs> rushes back to Hirotaka and finds out that like while she was gone, he got sexually harassed by this guy who <laughs> thought he was like really into yaoi and that, that meant he was gay and that meant he could like sexually harass him. It was which, pretty which fucked up. A, but Hirotaka's a is like whatever. Stereotypical <laughs> if you think about it, like with the way Japan yeah. thinks of it. But it also was hilarious because it was well, didn't the guy be like, Aren't you embarrassed? <laughs> It was good. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here, Taka invites Narami over his place after the con that night. Uh, and they're out at lunch and she's like worried about what pair of underwear she's going to be wearing but like she f- completely forgets to check when she goes to the bathroom which is funny. Um, on the bus, Narami is like reminiscing about how they used to be childhood friends when they grew up or were growing up and she can't really remember how they became friends in the first place though. And Hirotaka's is like, well, how did you become a Yaoi fangirl in the first place? And she starts having like a brain aneurysm as she tries to forget <laughs> how she became one. She's just remembering so, like her first Jojunshi that she read her, <laughs> where she discovered it. <laughs> yeah. So they get to his apartment and Narumi's like, oh, man, it's so different now that we're older and hanging out. Like she remembers when they were kids playing Donkey Kong Country 2 for Super Famicom. Definitely. Yeah, I recognize that too. And she was really bad at it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, 
And so, like, as she's thinking about this, though, like, Hira Talker's like, oh, why don't you take a shower and wash some sweat off from the con? Uh, but she enters a crisis because she's like, wait, Hirotaka is a man, though, right? Like, what if he, like, tries to take advantage of me in the shower? And so as she's thinking this, he starts to lean over her and she's like, oh, shit, he's doing it. And she's like, remembers, like, Narumi's a man. Also, my underwear is beige. And so she says out loud, <laughs> like, well, no, like, stop. Let's do it on a day when my underwear is pink. She doesn't say underwear, though. She just says when it's pink. And Hirotaka is <laughs> like what because he's like reaching for a nintendo wiimote just across from her and he's like do you want a pink nintendo wiimote what <laughs> <laughs> so very true it turns out though hirotaka invited taro and hanako for a sleepover and uh, narami's a little pissed that he didn't tell her at first but she has to forgive him when he's like this is the first time i've ever had friends over at my house and played games like so she gets like really depressed for him instead um but yeah, like he goes to take a shower at that point and Hanako and Narumi ask for permission from him to go raid his room and look for his porn stash. And he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> um, I guess this is a thing people do. <laughs> well, I, I, I just want to say nowadays, you mean go look on his computer? <laughs> Basically, like, right. Well, don't they right? have a discussion about that, though, where they're like, they do. wouldn't it be on his computer? And then the, the Naruko is like, no, it would it, like physical media for the win always or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they look around. They don't find anything. And the only thing they do find is that he has a bunch of anime figures and Narumi gets like insecure because all of his anime figures have huge breasts. <laughs> and she's like, oh, no, I don't measure up. <laughs> also, one of those figures I recognize is Yoshino Koiwai from um, Masamune Kun's Revenge. So, Hirotaka has shit taste confirmed, uh, <laughs> nice. as you'll know if you've watched that. Uh, so, but yeah, they they keep looking, and Narumi finds this like shoebox of Yu Gi Oh cards, and that's when like Hirotaka gets out of the shower, and he gets really nostalgic because he remembered that he had once traded cards with Narumi, and that's probably how their childhood friendship started. Yeah. Um, but he tells her like yeah you probably don't remember because like you had lots of friends and hobbies and distraction and I had no one <laughs> <laughs> and Narumi's like well you know that makes me feel really guilty and I want things to be fair between us so like if you feel I've really been a bad person you should just punch me and he's like okay <laughs> which catches her completely <laughs> off guard and she's like okay I'll take a punch but only like 40% full strength and she closes her eyes and he, instead of punching her he plants a kiss on her instead um and she's like, unfair attack. Uh, but yeah, he responds like, you know, I'm a man after all. And so like a call back to earlier. Um, and she's like, well, you probably only like big boobs, though. Uh, and then he looks up at his shelf and notices that all of the figures on his shelf have been turned around to <laughs> that face was the awesome. other way. I liked that little, <laughs> so that <funny>. little thing. <laughs> and so like the very end, like Narumi comes out to like ask for backup from Hanako, who's on the couch. But she is sleeping, like napping on Taro's shoulder. And he just says like, shh, be quiet. And so that was cute. And then the post credit stinger is just like, Kurotaka actually buys Narumi a pink Wiimote because he thought that was what she was really asking for. And uh, also he has his porn stash in his in Taro's desk at work, which is where he hides, <laughs> which is really funny. <laughs> but yeah, Leo, you like this episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I also liked that you kind of realize it's just not that they are two functioning otaku trying to date, but they're also like childhood friends, kind of just adds another element to the relationship. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm pretty happy with the progression of the relationship so far. I mean, it's definitely better and faster than most other relationships in anime. I agree. So, I mean, what they, they haven't actually kissed, but he like kissed her on the cheek, right? They're definitely yeah, doing well, better than well, 98% of anime yes. romances. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I say they, uh, they go for it. I say that but before the end of this is over, I bet you they have sex. I bet you. I bet you at this rate, yes. At first, I did not think that was going to happen, but now maybe. Yeah. I think yeah. that yeah. they will do it off screen. Like they will infer that <laughs> yes. it happened, They'll but just they suggest, won't show yeah. it. But, but that's also okay with me as long as they like talk about it some, not like explicitly. Right. But if they if talk about it a little, I will be satisfied. I'll agree All right, with Leo, you. tell us about episode four. No, you can't tell me what to do. Okay, fine. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> episode four, <laughs> episode four is mature love. 
Leo, Leo has as, turned is, into a five-year-old <laughs> child, everyone. Watch out. <laughs> oh, man. Is this title wrong? Is mature love as difficult? As difficult. Okay, no. I was forever, I think it should be is. But anyways, episode four. <laughs> it's uh, just a quick opening with Narumi Nur- watching some like OG Sailor Moon and crying about the nostalgia factor. And like here, Taka walks up and he like kind of <laughs> makes fun of her for it. But then he ends up watching it with her and crying also. He's like, I'm not crying. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty cool. Uh, the next day, Narumi is showing a picture to Hanako of her and a pretty girl who likes to cosplay. Taru is just like jokingly says, introduce me to her. And it turns out to be like it was Hirotaka dressed up because Narumi dressed him up. Yeah. <laughs> to look like a girl. So Taru's like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> but what this does is it gets it in Hanako's head that she now has to dress up Taro and think she can, you know, do it as, as a good job or better job because she's the cosplayer out of the group. Uh, but he is just absolutely against this idea. He does not want to do it at all. Uh, but then they end up, but and so they're just arguing about it, and they end up going to Narumi and Hirotaka uh, for for advice about it. And like Narumi at first is just all like, "Yes, do it. I'm all for this." And Hirotaka is like, uh, he doesn't really think it's a big deal. He's like, "I did it. It's it's whatever, man." Uh, Hanako comments that the two of them get along so well and like never fight. And like Hirotaka replies. With I gave up on her otaku obsession long ago, which causes her to try and attack him. It's pretty funny. <laughs> In the end, Hanako ends up bribing Taro with a new figurine to get him to do the photo shoot. Oh my god, the photo yes, the, shoot the, the was Yudachi hilarious. Kai too. The photo shoot is fucking hilarious. Like him, Dude, just his she, face. She, and she went the distance. <laughs> she set up like a fucking back screen, the lighting, prof- like professional super top-notch camera, like the <laughs> distance. It was just like I was like, uh, maybe you're a little way into this. <laughs> uh, the second part's kind of it's, it's pretty short and sh- sweet and straightforward. Okay, uh, but wait, them- let, me, let me insert here. I think a lot of girls really like to put makeup on their boyfriends. I personally have <laughs> never been into this, but I've had friends who just love this. And I think it has to do with like the guy is terrified and like at your mercy, right? <laughs> like really? and it's never in that position. I really do think that's what it is. Because like why else hmm. would why else would so many girls just love to put drag makeup on their boyfriends? Because it makes them feel like they're in the powerful, more powerful position, you would say. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> I like this theory. <laughs> All right. So the four of them go out, get drinks, and after work, and Hanako gets, like, drunk super quick. Apparently, she's a big lightweight. Uh, what the scene boils down to is that Hanako thinks Taro is growing tired of her, and he will throw her away for some other prettier otaku girl. And, like, but Taro keeps calling her, like, some old hag. I'll, I'll get to you in a second, Pecom. <laughs> oh, okay. And, but then in the end, he then ends up saying just like some things and you know and the two make up i didn't i was just like all right cool you know we gotta learn a little bit more information about these two relationship but be calm you really had a something to say here (laughs) well okay i had two things to say well one i found like the commentary about like she's like i'm not like ronka lee basically from macross f and he's like well yeah you're more like cheryl gnome because like she has big boobs i found that kind of funny just like that call out but like yeah like the whole thing with him like calling her like an ugly hag and like when she clearly has like these intense insecurities about her looks um like it's supposed to be like kind of something you can identify with it's supposed to be something like it's like a sweet like and sour relationship but he needs to stop like like dissing her looks it's like obviously not good for their relationship he i don't know called her an old hag what probably six times this episode maybe yeah i think he, yeah, it was pretty he bad. sees it as him joking and and showing her that he doesn't care how she looks but mm-hmm. it, it's really having the opposite effect right i don't know yeah. i just like the whole idea that these these people are obviously like they have their own preferences for like their ideal type and neither of them are each other's ideal type but as an adult you you never really get your ideal type physically and also emotionally right like you have to make sacrifices and compromises and that's normal Mm -hmm. and i kind of liked that they explored that a little bit in this episode it was good yeah 
And as otaku, it's like easier for them to be together because they have an understanding of what each other likes and stuff. Well, know? and that and that's also something I like that they explored because I will admit, as an otaku, I would much rather date an otaku, even if other things in the relationship are hard or like n- maybe not as much of a fit because it is such a part of my life. It, it makes it yeah. hard. If like the person you're trying to date knows nothing about anime and you doesn't really have, understand, like, a couple has to share interests somewhere. Yeah. So yeah. Obviously, for us, another person that has a big, you know, watches a lot of anime and you know and enjoys geek culture would you know be one of the best partners you could be with. So. Yeah. 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 So I thought that was interesting so, too. It was, it was interesting. Yeah. So to round out this episode, there's an after credit scene and it has Narumi and Hirotaka going home and Narumi says something along the lines of, what are we because she thinks they're only dating because it's easy and, and the both of them are probably just making compromises. This is where the compromises came up and it's kind of cool. Hirotaka says he likes seeing her do the things she loves and it's not because it's easier just to date another otaku. He delivers this line much better than I typed it out. So, <laughs> <laughs> But I'm assuming most people have watched this episode. So, uh, But yeah. then the two end up walking away holding hands and you know then again here's you know this anime being way more progressive than most other anime about relationships <laughs> yeah i agree it's it's yeah. nice to see um and by the way the, one of the upsides to hanago getting so angry this episode is she's voiced by miyuki sawashiro who i feel like she does like an angry voice better than almost anybody and i just love listening to it so like <laughs> i had mixed feelings during those scenes because i was like oh yes miyuki please continue it's, it's <laughs> but also one. like i was like oh this sucks for you this heard character cat. be calm <laughs> once once her to yell at him nice <laughs> well specifically i knew her. it all along <laughs> i knew it all but okay like there is one part in this where Hanako just get like I don't remember wh- how it came up, but everyone just continuously keeps thinking about how big her boobs are. <laughs> like they just keep staring. Do you remember this part? Like Narumi's like, yeah, man, they yeah. really are big. And then like the very first time Hanako shows up, Narumi comments on her boobs, and it doesn't stop from then I on. Know. Like Narumi's thinking in her head, like they really are big, and then and then Hirotaka's like they really are big, and, like, and I was like, what the fuck yeah. is this? What? <laughs> what what circle jerk have we entered? Like when will this end? This is the ongoing <laughs> gag for the show. It's I don't really see it stopping. Maybe taking a, a small break, but that's about it. Uh, I mean, it yeah. was funny. Become, uh, if they continue you, to do it, it won't be funny anymore. But it was funny. You figured out. You figured out which uh, figure it was that. Uh, oh yeah, I said it was like the Udachi Kai two from Conte <laughs> Collection, which was hilarious. <laughs> How much was that? But anyway, uh, model by it the was way? like sixty bucks or something. I'll look it up. That is not enough. If I if I was if I was to bribe someone to uh, to let me do drag makeup on them, it'd be at least two hundred dollars, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that would be the uh, starting man, I point. Would, I would love to do the next show become, but my oh, name's wait, not wrong. Cat. It's like one hundred fifty dollars. Sorry, this is oh. my territory. <laughs> Step off. Leo. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, it's like one hundred fifty dollars. This figure, jeez. Uh, one hundred fifty dollars okay. for that figure. Yeah, that makes more sense. That wasn't yeah. fifteen bucks. You're fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Let's move on to Hina Matsuri and Cat. You can take it away. All right. So this episode starts with Anzu running away from the shopkeepers. Cause she's, yeah, because she's stealing food to eat. So because she's been homeless ever since, like, okay, so she, ever since Nita, like, washed her clothes and ruined that device that was in her clothes on accident, um, she's been pretty much homeless. Uh, the homeless, This other homeless guy grabs her, and I guess he feels bad for her because he teaches her how to collect cans for money. And it's a fuck ton of work. Like, I think they walk around for, like, 10 hours or something. And they, they get yeah, about $7 for that much work for the whole day. And he he uses it as a lesson on why those people were chasing her for stealing. Because he's like, look, listen, like you spent you stole all this money from them. And look how hard it was for you to make the money. And, and it's all right. serious and everything. And and I, at this point, I just knew this this episode was going to be more serious than I wanted it to be. But but I persevered. Which I don't mind because I feel like they kind of pull it off uh, in a yeah. way that they, is like they heartwarming. Do. They do pull it off. I just wanted more jokes. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. then he introduces Anzu to the rest of the homeless people. 
And it's almost like when you get introduced at a new company or something. So he introduced <laughs> yeah. her and everyone's like, hello, hello. And, and this one guy is like, this girl isn't going to make it. As if like she just <laughs> showed up like in a suit and is like fresh off the press. And, and like the, the old guy at the company's like, this, this young end is, it doesn't have what it takes or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and Anzu buys everyone sake with the help of the guy that she first met. Um, Anzu sends, s- spends most of the first like part of this episode just in the sitting in the corner and sulking, kind of like a brat. And eventually, she gets checked by the other homeless people for sulking. Um, and they all talk about how Yasan, who is the what, who's the guy's name who uh, has helped her, has really helped her out a lot more than she knows, and she needs to be more grateful. Um, the homeless people convince Anzu to sing, and she sings this like absolutely terrible song about like some wolf eating. <laughs> and I mean, they all laugh, but I, I guess they're just all remembering their families or some some nostalgic bullshit. Uh, later on, Anzu gets caught by Nita being all homeless, and she's terribly embarrassed by this because she has a lot of pride. Uh, real quick, mm-hmm. her. Terrible singing is actually funny, unlike uh, Maha Shoujo Ore's, which oh, is just yeah. fucking Great comparison, actually. awful Jesus. to listen to, but this was just like, <laughs> you're cracking up at it. <laughs> I totally agree. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it, and there's like a yeah. right amount of time and, to do it for, and they did it right in Hinamatsu. Yeah, like her, yeah, because yeah, it, it's like short lived, it's not quite as long, and yeah, like you're correct. Comparing good to bad, those are these are some of the two best examples you can get. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I lo- it was very tone deaf, but like in a hilarious way, it was good. It was like musha, 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 or something. I don't know. That's all I can remember. <laughs> uh, but yeah, later on, Andre gets caught by Nita being all homeless, and she's really embarrassed because she's a lot of pride. He offers her about forty bucks to help her out, and she sees this as like an insult almost, and she runs off. But then she thinks about all the homeless guys and how they really need the money. And she changes her mind and she runs back to Nita to apologize and to ask for the money back. And this is another moment where it's supposed to teach you about humility and about how you have to work hard for money and how you have to, like, not be proud and all this. And I I get it. It just was really sort of pushing the point home. And I, I wasn't a fan of it, but I get what it was trying to do. Um, okay. Now the best part of the episode comes because, like, the next part is about Hitomi, who has become a bartender <laughs> by night. It's almost like you know, <laughs> you so know how ridiculous. like every magical girl like anime has that opening where like they explain how they're like secretly a magical girl at night or something. It's like that. Only mm-hmm. she's a bartender. Um, t- <laughs> they talk I like about- your take on it. <laughs> it kind of feels like that. I don't know. Uh, they talk okay so in the beginning it shows how utaku like made her do it at first by blackmailing her with pictures of her at the bar and threatening to send it to her school hitomi comes oh my god like hitomi at first counters because hitomi is actually a pretty smart bitch and she's like well i've got recorded audio of you saying that you're gonna blackmail me but then (laughs) utako basically tricks her into deleting it while Utaku Toku still has a backup of her data. And then I'm like, oh, you're smart, but you're still naive, kid. Like, you got the shit to <laughs> yeah, learn. Yeah. Um, then Hitomi's teacher comes to the bar. And I really love the part where the teacher wants to go home before they get to the bar. But then the teacher's boss is like, I plan on lobbying you to get a new raise next season. And, <laughs> and he's like, I would love to come. And he, like, all, all of a sudden is all sparkly and shit. And I'm like, mm. yes, awesome. <laughs> At first, the teacher is so uncertain because he he feels like it's Hitomi, but he doesn't know for sure. Like he knows it's his student. But then in the back of his head, he's like, this is not convenient for me. And then he's almost like in voluntar- voluntary denial about the fact that it is her. It's pretty hilarious. Um, <laughs> so he asked her to prove that she is a legit bartender by making him something called a million dollar, which I've never had a million dollar, but it sounds fancy as fuck. Sounds like something you would drink <laughs> with your pinky in the air. Um, <laughs> she shakes it all professionally, like, like looks pretty legit, like she's been doing this for decades. 
And then he's like, this is amazing. But then he's like, no, I need to see what you do with stirring, which is apparently another type of drink making, (laughs) whatever. Um, And he talks about how she doesn't have a callus from stirring, so she must not be good at it. And she looks all calmly confident, like, oh, so you think I can't stir? How cute. Ha ha, I don't even have to be cocky. I'm just going to show you. Like, it's very. You want to know what's in a million dollar? (laughs) What is in a million dollar? Tell us. Uh, I'll say the craziest ingredient for last. So we got some lemon, some sweet vermouth, pineapple juice, gin, grenadine, and egg white. Oh. Egg white is in a lot of Japanese drinks. That's um, terrible. I've found like cocktails. Is that kind of weird? I wonder That's how a... it tastes. I kind of want to try Ugh. it. It'd be pretty sweet. Yeah, that's about it. I mean, I guess I'd try it. I'll try anything once. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so so basically, she go, going back to the thing. So she's stirring. She's looking confident. She does a really good job, and they're all really impressed. And I keep thinking throughout this episode, like, how the fuck is it that she knows how to do this so fast? Because, like, there's, there's like, genius, and then there's whatever the fuck this is, right? She's, like, what's she's going on prodigy. Here? She's a prodigy. I don't know. That's all that's, that's what's going on. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's entertaining, but <laughs> so, something has to be going on. Um, so then it switches back to Hina. And this is the episode where you find out that she's just such a fucking spoiled brat that you can't hardly be tolerated. Like, it becomes really apparent throughout the last part of this episode. I don't know. I mean, I still love her to death. She can be a spoiled brat and still be enjoyable. <laughs> but there were yeah. times during this episode where I was like, oh, my God, girl. Like, um, So Hina realizes that Anzu would gladly, gladly take her place because she's like, oh, Anzu is homeless and I'm living it up here in this nice swanky apartment. Like, I better be nicer <laughs> to Nita. So she gives him extra meatballs like one day and then sees him off like all nicely. And so Nita is like, what the what the heck's happening? She's never been this nice before. Like I should reward her later. Then Nita, while Nita is at work, she tries to clean. Unfortunately, she's never cleaned anything in her fucking life. So like all she can do is fuck shit up. (laughs) It reminded me a lot of when I went to college and there would be kids there who had never cleaned anything in their life. And they would have to, like... So I had one roommate who had to have me teach them how to use, like, um, the the clothes washer, basically. Because <laughs> they'd never used <laughs> one <Damn>. before. <laughs> so, yeah, this, remi- this episode reminded me a lot of that. So she immediately breaks a vase, then spills water all over the floor. Then tries to air out the comforter and just, like, throws it out the window. And it, like, flies away. Then she finds a bunch of ikura in the fridge, which is that food she really likes. And she doesn't realize it's spoiled. And like she thinks to herself, I'm working hard today. I'm going to eat all of this shit. And I'm like, okay, girl, whatever you want to say to yourself. So she literally eats all this spoiled ikura. <laughs> and then she is really sick because it's it's almost like she just ate a bunch of spoiled meat or something. Yeah. <laughs> And she's trying to clean the dishes, and she just breaks a ton of them. And then Nita comes home, like, all ready to reward Hina, because he's like, she's been so good. And she's fucked up the entire house. (laughs) And that's basically the end of this episode. And I know, like, this is a good ramp-up point if you're binge-watching this series, and I totally get that. But if you're watching this week to week, this abrupt ending is a little abrupt, you know? Yeah. But it but flows it's, right it's into small. the next episode, Leo. So why don't you take that away? Mm-hmm. Oh, you don't want to add anything to this? <laughs> no, I think we can talk about it after the next episode so since they flow it, into one another. Yeah, it literally opens with Nita just like looking at his apartment with his shocked face because the bread and butter of this show are the freaking faces they put on these people. Oh my God, it's so good. Uh, so he just flat out kicks her out. He's like, I'm done with this, you know, but, you know, he gives, does give her a little bit of money that she just immediately just blows on food and everything. And she doesn't know what to do. So she's like just chilling by the river. Uh, Anzu ends up finding her and has uh, has her stay at her little shack with her for a while. <coughs> Excuse me. But like he is doing all kinds of like fucked up shit, like using up all her food and candles and whatnot. So after three days, she gets fed up with Hina and kicks her out also. <laughs> I love that. She's like, she's not even fit to be homeless. 
<laughs> yeah. God. Get this bitch Such out of my hut. Burn. I can't even have this yeah. bitch in my hut, basically. He told me stops by Nita's apartment because she has uh, Hina's uh, schoolwork and whatnot. And, you know, she's like talking to him through their comm system or whatnot, you know? Yeah. And she's something's off. She can't really figure out what, but he's like, yeah, just put it in the mailbox and uh, uh, I'll grab it later for her. She's just <laughs> sick or something like that. Uh, so she ends up le- leaving and oh sorry yeah, that's right Nita recognized her as like the bar lady so that was kind of funny it's just a little, nice little joke and whatnot <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. but then when uh, Hina leaves she runs in Utaku who is like running like this like homeless food little shelter little thing right there and she needs her help so she makes her help her uh, and, and then Utaku is surprised when she sees Hina and Anzu both show up for their soup and she's like what the hell is going on <laughs> and then just hilariously that night at the bar everybody just judges the absolute shit out of nita for kicking hina out and oh my gosh they, that's some hilarious l- part literally they literally run him out of the fucking bar don't they just <laughs> shit, like, like get- kick him out or something like that yes until until, until he just <laughs> leaves it's so good and then, then she even uh, gets salt and like throws it after him or something doesn't <laughs> she, she she runs outside and, like throws salt on the ground and she's like <laughs> like like you do with like what I think Japanese do that for like ghosts and stuff like, or like that demons or like evil spirits. Or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was it was so good. Uh, but interestingly, on his way home, Nita sees Hina performing with like a band, and she's like making the lead singer float around all this crazy shit, and he's just standing there, just like floored out of his mind. Uh, he ends up going back to the bar like the next night, and Utako says he's cut off until he makes up with Hina. He's like, fine. He goes back home, and that's where he finds Hina sitting outside the door. And it turns out some of the money she earned, she used to basically buy like a cheap vase, and she gave it to Nia as a gift, you know, like, please take me back. He takes her back in, and then you get a nice, cool little scene where he like proudly displays the vase Hina got him. It kind of touching. It was pretty good. Yeah. But, yeah. The rest I, of the I episode, like that moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good moment. Uh, this show is surprisingly, for being a comedy, like has some touching moments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it gets crazier later on, so I've been told I haven't watched them yet. Uh, I think the best comedies have a heart to them, you know? Uh, I mean, um, I, I want more comedy in this, but I'm also a heartless bitch. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what's the heart to Kono Suba, though, then, Becom? Uh, uh, that's a hard one, man. Because <laughs> that's that's I because I know you think that's one of the best, also. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, think, I, I can tell you like the heart to Maid Dragon for sure. Like that's very obvious. But like Konosuba yeah. is a little harder. That's that's very scathing, like ridiculous <laughs> thing. I guess it's their camaraderie when things do work out, kind of. <laughs> Their little camaraderie as a group when they come together. Oh, I think sure, sure. I think how they all interact and like their just general dynamics would be what sold that show. But that's not the show we're talking about. Yeah, I think True. the so. best part of this entire episode is just when Hitomi like goes with Anzu and she keeps she keeps thinking like of worse situations and then finding out it's even worse than she imagined. Like at <laughs> first she's like, imagine. yeah, she's like, oh, her parents must be really poor. And then she gets there and she's like, oh, maybe her parents are like, like something else. And then she's like, oh, this bitch is homeless. And then like, it just keeps going <laughs> down and down and down. Like, yeah. Then, yeah. Then there's a the part where she asks her about like, well, how much she makes? She's like, I'll make $7 a day. <laughs> and then Toby's <laughs> like, I make that in half an hour. <laughs> yeah, Toby's just like, I can never tell her. <laughs> yeah. She must so never the rest know. Of the, yeah. <laughs> The rest of the episode, we find Hitomi like listening to some of her customers' complaints and like just reassuring him. Mm-hmm. She's just like, she's just way too got freaking good at her job. She's basically the bartender from the anime bartender who is like, yeah. a guru who will solve all your problems while giving yeah. you the perfect drink. You know, yeah. And and this is what yeah. Pat's talking about. So she ends up taking out the trash and notices Anzu collecting cans, and she wants to help her. So she takes her to a guy that runs one of the shops around there and they get a lot of cans from him and she asks if uh, Anzu can have them and he says you know it's not really my decision to make but you know so I can't do that but then <laughs> Tommy threatens him by like well your boss is one of my customers and uh, I'll tell him you lays around this time he's like oh just take them all <laughs> <laughs> and then that's where all the stuff Kat is talking about Yeah. Uh, 
And that's when like Anzo is so happy and invites Tomi over as a thank you. And it's just one giant gag with it. Uh, Tomi being blown away that she is just completely homeless. It's, <laughs> it is p- priceless. It is. Yeah. It's, it's gold. Fun. It is gold. This whole show is gold. I love it. I think it's, yeah, it's probably the best comedy of the season. I would say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Easily. Ooh, gee. Is there other comedies out there this season? I mean, like, there's rom coms. I don't know. So yeah. yeah, this is probably the purest oh, yeah. comedy. But there's definitely other games in town. There's Comic Girls, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> That's a comedy. <laughs> I mean, in a lot it's of ways, it's supposed yeah. to be. It's, it's kind more of a slice of, of life, though. Comedy, but it's, yeah. it's fine. Jesus, you know what else Christ. is a comedy? Darling in the Franks. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Apparently. So uh, episode 15 uh, of Darling Franks is called Gian, which is that bird that has one wing that needs another bird to fly kind of thing. That's so, not a real thing, right? It can't be. No, I don't know. I didn't look no it up. There's no way. There's no way. <laughs> I mean, maybe it is. You should look it up, Leo. Let me I'm know. I'm looking it up right now. So Hero's <laughs> sidelined, right? Uh, and Zero Two has gone off to the front lines without him. Um, and they're all going to attack this place called the Grand Crevasse, which they are told by like the council it could change change the future of humanity um so in this episode we see the nines in battle for the first time in their franks and they're paired in ways which are very interesting because they have like several like male pistols i'm assuming they're male uh i assumed their gender i'm really sorry uh they're riding (laughs) doggy style in the front of the franks which was like Mm -hmm. we didn't know that was possible till now and one of them seems to be at least like a female pilot yeah, so, that totally confused the freaking shit out of me. Well, and they don't even yeah, tell you anything about it. They're just like, oh, we showed you this. Like, now let's move on. <laughs> exactly. Like, I was wondering if they're, like, intersex or something. Or, like, I, I really want the show to tell me what is up with the nines. Like, I hope they explain that by the end of the show. Just this add it to show, the list of the things the show needs to explain. This show is just a peekaboo, <laughs> like a striptease peekaboo. It's like, oh, we showed you a little bit. Now we're not going to show mm-hmm. you anymore. Yeah, I always have so many questions at the end of these episodes, but a Gion bird is mm-hmm. a uh, Chinese mytholog- mythological bird. So it's uh, mythological. Okay. Uh, it's a mythical okay. bird with only, this is this is a little different, with only one eye and one wing. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So that's not the one eye part. But, Sounds like a sad yeah. ass bird to me. <laughs> Sounds like a bird that would sleep with one eye open, gripping oh, its pillow tight. There we go. <laughs> That's the part of the episode well, right there. Guys, thanks for tuning in. This podcast is now over. <laughs> Leo just like ends the podcast immediately before we get sued by Metallica. Okay, so <laughs> the fighting's going well until another question pops up in the form of a big ass claxosaur that's like as big as a friggin' mountain. And it just emerges from underneath Plantation 26 or whatever that they're defending and just completely turns it over and, like, destroys it. Um, And so the High Council, like, freaks out, kind of, and they order, like, a Protocol 32, which is a suicide bombing mission where they have several of the Franks pilots just blow themselves up to stop this Claxosaur. Wait, what'd you say, Leo? I said, hey, Kamikaze. Kamikaze. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, it's so the it stops it, but like the Claxosaur like tips over into Plantation Thirteen, and it dumps a bunch of small Claxosaurs inside. And so Zero Two is in her like stampede mode because she's all monstrous now, and all the other Thirteens rush to help, but they're getting overwhelmed. And so like Hero is watching from the control room with Doctor Franks, who kind of prods him a little bit, and he like runs off, and he goes to like Zero Two's room in their mansion and like she sees that like she had taped up the like hand mirror she had broken so like for all of this and other reasons he like runs off to try and like get to her so he can talk to her so he jumps in a training robot and he gets like instantly wrecked by a claxosaur as soon as he gets to the (laughs) battlefield obviously um but ichigo's like i'm not gonna let you fight and goro's like i've had enough of this bullshit (laughs) and shuts down the (laughs) robot and he's like hero get in this damn robot shinji uh (laughs) and go like talk to your girl um so hero yeah gets in the franks pilots with ichigo and hero's mind Mm. enters ichigo's mind because like now they mind meld apparently when they're piloting which wasn't really like a thing so much until now except for hero and zero two did it a couple episodes ago but like the beginning in the show that didn't really come up so it's kind of out of nowhere um so 
there's a really hilarious moment. Oh, well, first of all, Ichigo realizes that there is nothing in Hiro's mind about her. It's all thoughts about Zero Two. So she kind of gives up the game at that point. Um, but as they head off to Zero Two, there's this funny moment because like, uh, like her, like Zero Two's inner dialogue has been popping up on screen in the form of text for the whole episode. But oh. now that she's like turning into a monster, right? Yes. Uh, it's it's all in Leet speak. <laughs> I didn't know what the Which fuck was that was called. I just knew it looked fucking weird. And I was like, what is this? Like, what the fuck it's is like this all, supposed like, to be? It's like all capitalized or uncapitalized letters and like fucking numbers <laughs> thrown in. It's so dumb. Um, but I guess that's the English translation, right? Like, so I looked at like some of the Japanese text that th- shows up on screen and it looked like a little off as well. So I'm sure they were doing the same thing with the Japanese text. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... Ichigo and Zero Two start like slapping each other with their mechs before Ichigo finally tells Zero Two like stop it I will let you have Hero just get your damn act together and so they, Hero they goes into Zero Two's fight. cockpit they have a big yes. slap God. fight <laughs> so one of them is victorious yeah so here Hero gets out and goes into Zero Two's cockpit and they cut away for a little bit uh, to go to this brief scene where like the others are fighting this Klaxosword that's inside and like a core drops out of it right and out of the broken core rolls this little golden human-like fetus thing. And Miko and Zorame are like, what the hell is that? It looks like a human. So they're like, hmm. And, and then so, they like, just meanwhile, totally Papa drop the count- this. Oh, wait, what'd you say, Leo? I said, then they totally just freaking drop that and just forget about it. Well, sort of. I'm sure it'll come up. But, like, yeah. <laughs> Though they have dropped a lot of things in the show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They'll never come Jesus. up again. I want some um, answers, damn it. Uh, Give me the answers. I want the truth. Uh, so, uh, Papa and Counts are just suiciding whole plantations now into this huge Klaxosaur to try to kill it. Like, a little extreme. <laughs> yeah, they're like letting people back up their like psyche and mind, like, but only to like thirty three percent or thirty seven percent. They're not even guys, letting like. Did you guys feel yeah. like this part of the fight got so out of like? scale that it's like that game where you used to roll like over things and get bigger and bigger <laughs> and, then you just, yeah. yes. and then you're just like rolling over like bigger and bigger things like didn't you think that was kind of the way that this fight was going at this point they're just like I mean, just throw yeah. whole plantations at it fuck it like, yeah possibly <laughs> yeah like basically it's getting out of control so while everything's going out of control hero can't get through to zero two so he like grabs these huge antlers that have grown out of her like head that are like since he's a monster now uh and we see this flashback (laughs) and it flashback and just confirms hero's memory was altered uh and we see that like dr franks kept him around even though he considered him to be useless because he like ingested some of zero two's blood and Hero realizes, like, how hard she tried to remember him and, like, the word darling and, like, all of him remembering this, like, triggers her antlers darling. to just, like, break apart in his hands. And then they, like, hug each other and they start, like, scream crying at each other about, like, all the things that have been happening. Um, which has been memed on Twitter and everywhere else, like, like crazy. It's so funny. <laughs> but, um, like, Hero is, like, really oh, determined. The, where they're like, wah, 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 wah. yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's really funny. You should find that on Twitter if you haven't seen it already. It's pretty messed up. <laughs> um, but they're yeah, they're basically like yeah, we've said horrible things to each other. But like, I, Hero's like, I'm sure we have a journey to go on together. And like he t- he says like, together we're one person. And he kisses her. And all of the people who thought that they were not gonna ship fucking Zero Two and Hero and wrote death threats to trigger must feel really dumb right about now. But that's another story. Um, so once they kiss, they start. They transform Strelitzia, right? And they, like, go off to, like, blow up this huge Klaxosaur. And all the while, like, Zero Two is screaming, like, Darling! Darling! They, like, they, just, like, sexual they ecstasy. They're they basically, basically like, orgasming every jolly, time she like, says and, darling. Yeah, they basically have, like, an earthquake-sized <laughs> orgasm together. Like, on live <laughs> comm in front of every single person and like, the entire, yeah. like, world. <laughs> and even Ichigo's like, I'm happy for you two. <laughs> she, like, even she's like, okay, these two she's are like, really I happy. I get it. I need to literally hear you two have sex. I get it. <laughs> and then at the end of this episode, of course, they have to pull out another MacGuffin, which is that the fucking 
out of like the grand crevasse dome which they break through comes this huge human hand which is like in the sh- is a claxosaur but it's in the shape of a human hand and it like reaches out and pulls back like the thing they just blew up because it has a bunch of cores left inside of it mm-hmm. and so that's a big cliffhanger well, about what the hell's going to happen next kind of smash like everything around them but them which i thought was yeah very it doesn't convenient. kill them yeah, yeah. it yeah. leaves this weird tower in the middle yeah, so like, whatever what? the hell that is. Are we supposed to believe that conveniently they didn't get hit or that it intentionally didn't hit them? I think it was hinting that it might be intentional because maybe though, like I think it probably has something against like Papa and the council and all those people, but not, not the children who are just like hmm. forced to fight. Okay. Maybe. But yeah. Yeah, no, Very it was a good episode. Lots of stuff to answer <laughs> yeah did you notice Definitely. that when when they cry inside their suits their suits like cry weird x's did you notice that <laughs> no oh, that's no. funny though it's really <laughs> it's cool looking trigger. like <laughs> i kind of liked it actually yeah it's cool i like that touch um oh yeah so there was another episode right it was a recap special and it was kind of interesting Kat, there were some interesting one. things yeah okay so All of this footage is from a pre-screening that they showed. Like, I guess they were showing a replica of the Straitsia, you know, whole mecha. And then they had all the cast Mm -hmm. there talking about their hopes for the anime before any of it actually aired. Um, Okay, so (laughs) it was a little interesting seeing all of the voice actors in person because I don't usually give a crap about voice actors. I'm going to be honest. So (laughs) I was like, oh, wow, this person looks like this. Um, so first they talk with the voices of Ichigo, who I guess Kana Ichinose plays Ichigo, and the voice of Goro, (laughs) who is played by Yuchiro Umihara. And I love how, okay. Apparently just came down with autoimmune disease, apparently. Oh, really? He's he's in the hospital right now. Yeah, I saw that. Oh, shit. Um, but yeah, no, Kana... Throughout her entire inter- interview, when she's talking about all of Ichigo's scenes, she like she talks about a bunch of the pervy scenes, but she she talks about them a hundred percent straight faced, as if there's nothing pervy about it, and she didn't even ever imagine that there was ever anything pervy about the scenes. And I was just amazed <laughs> by like her <laughs> poker face, and I couldn't tell if it was like an actual poker face or if she's just that naive. No, I, I she's being know. professional, I feel like. I guess. I, I was like, but it's such a, such a good poker face if she's being professional. Because, like, damn. Yeah. Like, she doesn't even, like, smirk a little bit or smile or anything. Like, I think these voice actors have gotten really used to being fake excited about the shows that they're in. Like, f- for some of them. I, I'm sure they're actually excited about some of the shows that they're in, too. But, like, mm-hmm. I think they're really good about, like, selling the product kind of thing, you know? Yeah, that's probably what it is. Because I was, like, waiting for her to at least, like, give a little smirk or something. But she just wasn't. Like, she was just deadpan. I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um. So then Goro talked about how he really didn't like his character. The guy who plays Goro um, didn't like Mm -hmm. Goro's character at all until the pervy beach episode. And then he's like, oh, I guess he is a real person. And now he likes his character a lot more. I thought that was interesting. What? Yeah. I mean, like, if you really think about it, a lot of these characters, like, let their hair down for the first time in that pervy beach episode. So it makes yeah. sense that the voice actors, like, I finally understand the character a little bit now because they finally told us a little bit about the character. So. Yeah. It's funny, though. Um, but yeah, no. Um, and then they talk a little bit about the manga, which is apparently being made based on the anime. So, like, the manga is coming out after the anime airs, which is really rare. <laughs> And interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and okay, so the guy who is in charge of the the manga just looked so fucking tired throughout the entire <laughs> interview. I just felt so bad for him. Like half the interview was him just being like, "It's been a lot. It's been really hard." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You can and tell it's, it's the like, guy who wrote the manga for To Love Ru, and he's like, "Drawing robots is really harder than I expected. And, like, <laughs> it takes a lot of effort." <laughs> I just looked like he just like crawled out of the trenches of World War Three to like report <laughs> on it, so he could like dive back in there. <laughs> like, it's so good. Wow, I felt I'm gonna have bad to go watch this now. 
<laughs> it sounds very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun episode. I think everybody should go check it out if they have some spare time. Honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, um, oh what? shit! Well, I don't have that. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. Then don't well, check it out. Uh, okay, and then also the voice of Mitsudu is kind of an androgynous person. Like I couldn't tell if the voice actor who was playing Mitsudu was a guy or a girl, honestly, because it's that kind of mm-hmm. androgynous where it really could go either way. Um, and I thought that Just was like interesting. like that character from Eurocamp. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh. be gone. All right, you, you started some fired. shit. All right. Shots are fired. <laughs> Confirmed. Uh-huh. Um, okay, and then also... I thought it was interesting how the two main voice actors are clearly the prettiest damn people in the entire room. And it's kind of yeah. interesting how even though voice acting is supposed to be sort of a profession where it's based on non-visual aspects, it's obviously very helped by how pretty you are. Because <laughs> the, the two prettiest people are the, the main actors for a reason, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I'm sure they're talented too. But I, I'm also have sure you, that that's you, not why. Have they you got never there. seen Gilbert Gottfried? <laughs> no, no, I, I just told you. I don't pay attention to the voice actors. Um, <laughs> ah, shit. <laughs> but yeah, what, did you have anything to say, Vico? Oh, yeah. Just the one thing that I thought was funny was when the director came on to talk about like his thoughts going forward. And he's just like. Uh, I'm not sure if the ending of the show will be a happy one for everybody, <laughs> but I hope viewers will be satisfied by understanding each character's story purpose. And it's like, bum, yeah, bum, I hope bum. you actually explain each character's story purpose. Because like, I don't know if you're going to. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. I don't know. I guess we but, will. Yeah, that's an ominous, you know, like foretelling of what's to come. <laughs> I guess. Damn. They got me worried. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that if that's it, uh, Kat, you can wrap us up. All right. Okay. Thanks for listening, guys. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe to us on YouTube to get updates on our new podcasts or videos. Follow us on Twitter at Nerdim Another for updates as well. And you guys have a great day. And we're all gonna run out of here. <laughs> we'll see you next right. week. Bye. Peace. Later, everybody. Mm-hmm. Bye. <laughs>